Howdy. Howdy. Stay, tell us your name and where you're from and show us what you got here. I'm Ken Piku and I live in Austin, Texas. And um, I make tools for luthiers and I also do woodwork. So uh, today, in addition to the tools, I brought this um, guitar stand that I make that um, folds up nicely. And then I, I also make a um, music stand, which I, I designed around the Manhasset mechanism so you can just put it where you want it to go and it stays. Uh, both of these are made out of walnut. Um, one of the main reasons I'm here this year is to promote this new tool that I have. It's called the Otter. And it's essentially a small router table that's so small that you can just flip it over and use it as a regular router. Oh, yeah. And then it also has rails if you're doing repairs and need to route a bridge off the top of something or, or flatten a piece. Yeah. And if you reverse the fence, you can use it as a joiner. Right. And uh, it'll accept template guides and you can right, right. make bridges or what, yeah. what have you. Under template, right? And yes. then you got your robo sanders. I've right? got the robo sanders, which I've been making forever. And then this is kind of a special one I make mostly for violin makers that yeah. doesn't, it overcuts. Okay, so right, they, yeah. can, they can use their forms as a template Follow for the, the top. And get the overhang, right. Yeah. Nice. And what's this little thing right down here? Uh, this is a bridge compensator vise. And you can take any old scrap of wood and whatever you want your compensation angle to be, just uh, make a shim. And then this, um, this runs on my luthier's friend, and you would chuck a mill into your drill press it, to yeah. cut the compensation. Okay. okay. All right, thanks. And um, of course, the luthier's friend, which is uh, a thickness sander that fits on your drill press. And then this is. Um, a little small parts wise for <laughs> thicknessing saddles. Yeah, yeah. You work on the same thing. And so anyway, I've been having a great time here attending all the seminars and it's just great. Okay, thanks. I am Marshall Brunet. I am from Evanston, Illinois. Uh, been there since uh, 1966. Uh, well, I haven't personally been, but our shop has. So uh, today I brought a guitar a violin, and cases of plenty. Uh, I am the U.S. distributor for This Is Not USA, which actually, uh, This Is Not was born here at the GAL three years ago. Nice. Where uh, one wrong song, This Is Not, a.k.a. Jeep, right behind you, uh, he came to me and said, I have an idea for a case. And I said, show me something I've never seen before, because I've seen it all before. <laughs> And uh, that was six years ago. Three years ago, he came with something I've never seen, mm -hmm. and I couldn't be happier. Uh, these cases, uh, they're an ultra lightweight flight case. Uh, they're a PVC ABS plastic. They'll support about 700 some odd pounds on the lid. We've done more. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they have really good thermal properties. They hold and retain humidity like none other. So it'll, uh, it'll support two baggage handlers, right? Oh, three. Uh -huh. <laughs> I mean, you know. For, within, reason. within reason, you know, without jumping. Yeah. Uh, they're really good. Uh, they've survived many 14 plus foot impacts. Nice colors, too. Well, thank you. Yeah, we've got a wide range of colors. There's uh, eight various colors, and then we also have a lower price case, which is our active series. Uh, that comes in one glorious color uh, of gray. <laughs> how many sizes? I mean, how many forms? Uh, currently, we have uh, five different forms. We're working on six more. Uh, or yeah. Yeah, three more, I guess. And uh, I have uh, classical guitar, triple OOM, and dreadnought sizes. And I also have violin cases and viola cases, which are also going to be, uh, we're going to, we're in the process of changing out the interiors on these uh, to work for ukulele of oh, various okay. sizes as well as various mandolins. Inside the same shell? Inside of the same shell, yeah. Mold costs are very expensive. Uh, so we're trying to keep the, the economy down. Let's quickly take a look at that guitar you brought. Yeah, absolutely. This guitar that I brought... Oh, ain't that pretty. ...is one of my guitars. I, I built this for myself, uh, which I never get a chance to do. I've 
built about a dozen guitars for myself, and they never last more than a couple weeks. So uh, this is uh, Quilted Maple out of uh, Michigan, which I logged myself. Yeah, that's, that's not Western Maple. No, no, this is Michigan Maple. Uh, I logged that one myself. Uh, this top came from uh, the Wasatch Mountain Range. I also logged that one myself. Uh, in keeping in tradition of uh, the Brunei spirit, uh, we go out into the forest and do dumb stuff. <laughs> uh, this is uh, Madagascar Rosewood. I did not log this myself. <laughs> uh, the sides on this guy are about nine tenths of a millimeter thick and lined with silk. Uh, it's a three piece side that I took inspiration from an Antonio Tortoise that was in our shop. And then the back side uh, also uh, retains that same aesthetic. Uh, this is a little parlor sized guitar, which is uh, uh, was a, something that I always wanted with a little short scale, but it's got a huge sound that belies what, uh, what it looks like. That's gorgeous. Uh, thank you. I also brought one of my violins with me, too. You made it? I did. I made this one. Let's violin. have a look. Absolutely. Oh, yeah, you're the fiddle maker in the family, right? I am the fiddle maker. I do like to fiddle around. This is a violin that I made. Uh, five years ago now, or just shy of five years ago. Uh, this is uh, spruce from the same logging trip as that top. Uh, this is maple from the same uh, logging expedition into Michigan. Uh, this one, uh, I also made the matter root for the pigment, which is a pain in the butt. Okay, yeah, but you're getting authentic now. I know. And uh, I finished up this violin. I would have gone through and done a lot more to make it look more pretty. But my wife went into labor while I was doing in the middle of the last coat of finish. Uh, she went into labor with our daughter, yes. and she came into my shop and says, I'm in labor. I said, I'm in the middle of a coat of varnish. <laughs> and uh, she said, but I'm in labor. I said, do you want this thing to be splotchy? <laughs> wow. So I managed to finish it off. There's a committed luthier, folks. It is, it is. <laughs> I, I run the risk of uh, life and limb every time uh, my, my wife has a child. <laughs> and... Uh, my daughter was actually baptized in sawdust because uh, while I was sitting in the hospital, uh, I figured I'm not doing anything and I need to do something. So I took my bench hook, a knife, and a bridge, and I cut, uh, not this bridge, but uh, the other previous bridges. Basically, while I was holding my daughter in one hand, I was holding the bridge and carving a bridge while she slept in my arms. I like that family legacy, man. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, they're now... Uh, uh, Two of my kids, or three of my kids, now help me in the shop from time to time. Uh, they pull frets, they fix cracks, they sweep. I mean, they, they, my kids are getting the same start that I got, so uh, they'll be here uh, probably starting at the next one. That's how, that's how Strad did it. Exactly, yeah. Okay, thanks, great to see you. Thank you, it was great to see you. Okay, I'm James Rodman, I'm from uh, San Antonio, Texas. Uh, and this is a tool that I developed uh, to quickly uh, adjust the height and the radius on acoustic guitars. You can adjust the action. You can make a copy of a saddle or make a copy of the saddle that's just a bit taller, so you wanted to get rid of shims or you needed to raise the action a little bit. All right. How's it work? It works. Uh, it uses a series. Oops, sorry, it uses a series of radius templates uh, to match the, the radius on your guitar, and you in, install the saddle and the clamps. Yeah, yeah, okay, it runs off the ledge, yeah. yeah. it runs off a fence, and so you can calibrate the tool. Uh, so oh, yeah, I'll, you really calibrate it. Yeah, I'll, I'll, usually I'll run it across the face just to remove a tiny amount to make sure the radius is accurate. Okay. I'll set my uh, dial indicators to zero, okay. and then reinstall the saddle and the guitar, measure the action at the 12th fret. I'll Got need it. to remove yeah. twice that amount at the saddle. So Perfect. then you can dial in. Say you, you dial it in. Yeah, say I needed, needed to remove 20 thousandths from the treble side and 30 thousandths from the bass side. Wow, you literally dial it in. And then I can uh, run it across the sander and it'll be to height. And the, the same sort of thing applies. If you want a taller saddle, you just move the, the uh, adjustment arms away from the disc a little bit. That's fascinating. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, my name's Joanne Tompkins. I had the Rescue Pearl Company. And the products, I'm from California. The products I have here today are reconstituted stone, um, mother of pearl, and all the different kind of shell types, uh, abalone, and some laminate material. We make uh, rosettes, uh, dots. I have a small CNC machine now, so I can make to order your size rosette in reconstituted stone, whatever diameter you want. So we're happy to be here. My sister came along with me to help with the tours. <laughs> and rescue is the name of your town. It's not what you do. I, yeah, it's the name of the town. 
They say we rescue pearls. <laughs> rescue pearls. All right. Yeah. Okay, thanks. All right, thank you. Well, we are um, originally from Bombay in India. I came here to USA in 1964. I've been around and known Tim for a long, long time since I can never remember. I think he was a little kid when I know and knew him. But he's grown up quite a bit now. Even his kids have grown up and they are, they are much bigger now than I ever saw them. I've been doing wood business since 1979 and it has been a great business for me and GAL has been a wonderful association for me to be associated with and I love it. I, en I enjoy every minute of my being here. I don't know how, I don't know how better to put it but I continue I'm, I'm getting old but I'm 77 but uh, till I live I think I'll be here. Thank, thank you Tim thanks a lot. Okay, thanks to Tim and Bon and <laughs> Deb for making this all happen. Uh, this time I am displaying only one instrument, and this is one of the last ones that I made. It's a slimline, semi-hollow, acoustic electric uh, jazz guitar. It's a uh, one and three quarter inch nut, ebony fretboard, spruce top, uh, mahogany back, mahogany neck, vertical grain, and my fan frets. Uh, other than that, what I'm doing really is downsizing my shop since I've been forced to retire because of loss of eyesight. So I'm selling things that I was going to probably be using for the rest of my life if other things were different. Okay, <laughs> okay thanks. <laughs> is that okay? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> my name is Tim Ellis. I'm with Access Bags and Cases. And we brought these bags and cases. Um, we have a program for builders and that's why we're here at the Gals. You custom make outlines, the forms? We don't do custom per se. We can for a certain quantity, but uh, we have a lot of different shapes and you know 90% of the market guitars and we have a shape that will fit it. We also have a line of pads that sort of help take up the space on some of the... Looks like you make uke? We do, yeah, uke. Mandolin, banjo, open back banjo. No harp guitar? No harp guitar, no mandola. Those are difficult. <laughs> OK, thanks. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my name's Randy Meinert. Uh, I'm from Roswell, Georgia, a uh, uh, suburb of Atlanta. I brought my first, pro second prototype, actually, of a vacuum base that uses four separate pads instead of just one central pad and I find there's value in that because it's more versatile. Mm -hmm. My pads have the ability to move around this base such that you can put different instruments on it. Yeah. Um, uh, and I've designed uh, the ability to move them without having a problem with the tubes. Oh, I gotcha. Yeah, it does, the uh, vacuum doesn't come through the stem. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's mostly used without the neck, but I provide the neck because I want to be able to, at one point, put a dial caliper and do setup as well. Um, I have built this, but I haven't used it yet, so I don't, I can't attest to its effectiveness, but I wanted to make this a multi-purpose. Yeah, you're halfway tool. to a neck jig already, right? Yeah, and plus I don't have to have a strap over the body of the guitar, because this holds the guitar incredibly well. Just with the bass alone, I can, I can mount it in my vise like this and work perfectly solidly with both hands, and, uh, and I found it really valuable. You got a hold of it in four places. Yes. And even, and, and as another person pointed out, even if you're doing a repair, with the bridge on, you can still put it soundboard face down if you're working on the back, oh, yeah. because oh, yeah, this yeah. the bridge does not encumber the... All right, with a big round one, you can't do that. You can't do that. Once also, the bridge is on, you can't do it. Also, the big round one is in the weakest part of the plate, out from the edges, and the way you're doing it, you're in the strong part over the edge. Well, also, I mean, I think LMI says, like, you've got 400 pounds pull, or some ridiculously high number. I'm not as comfortable with that. There's there's a total of about 110 pounds of pull pressure here because of the you know multi, you know the calculation of the square area and the vacuum, um, and it's really quite sufficient. You'd have to manhandle the thing to get it off the vise. Uh, so, so I found it really useful. And really, what I'm here to do is, am I here to sell it? Right now, I'm here to have try to improve it with people, 
And if I get enough people that are interested, as I was telling to one of the guys from a Luthier school in Canada, if I get enough people and I can buy the parts in bulk to make drop the price down, then it might be something that people would reach for. It's effective. I just, um, buying parts from McMaster car are expensive, but that's the way I can get these kind of in small quantities. Okay, thanks. Thanks for your help. Okay, I'm, uh, my name is Chris Klumper. I, I'm with Luthier Tool Company. Uh, we've been at it for, for a long time. So our new little uh, machine is for side bending. Okay. Uh, let me, I'll do a quickie demo. Okay. Uh, now I'm not going to put the put the air on for the simple reason I haven't tested it. But this is all controlled by a, a screen. So this is your run screen. We have a program screen. Okay. And if you if you're afraid for programming, you could do it all manually. Okay. So we'll go to the run screen. Okay. Watch the arms, and we'll hit start. And we wrote a little program that will allow you to, you know, you can basically do anything you want. The biggest thing that I was looking for is uh, some controllability for any kind of species of wood that you want to bend so that uh, you don't have to break them anymore, you know, and that you can control every aspect of the bend itself. And, uh, Does it also control the heat? Oh, yes. we got two heat ports here. A heating blanket here and a heating blanket blanket on this. So everything is controlled. Now the heat can be controlled in cycles. So, for example, if if you need if you want to if you want to bend hit this, you can have a hotter temperature. At the waist, hot at the waist. Hot at the waist, but then can bring it back down, and then you can you can have hot temperature to bring it up to a cycle, and then as this goes down, you can start cooling. So you don't have any uh, uh, a lack of uh, cooling time. You can kind of keep it down to a minimum. Well, you've uh, you've had some sweet gizmos over the years, and they're getting bigger and fancier. This is wild. Well, this this is the bigger one, but the next one will be small. Yeah. And what else we got here? Oh, this. Uh, is, so some of this is more familiar. Yeah. This you've seen these before. Uh, our, um, we're only we're only now just building the adjustable, the standard. Uh, we get more more um, uh, orders for the adjustable, so we just decided let's just do the adjustable binding cutter. Okay. Um, these we can't keep in house. Okay. For putting slots in slotted peg heads, right? Yep, exactly. So you have one jig that you drill the holes and then you do all your slots. It's all in the same place at the same time. Nothing, same time. nothing, nothing gets moves. off. Nothing gets off. You know. You set it to the center line once, and you're good. You're good. Actually, it's self-centering. Uh -huh. Oh yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah, I see. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that is cool. Thanks. And then uh, you want one more? One more. One more. Um, you see the neck angle jig? This is a. Uh, the problem. Well, I shouldn't say a problem. The industry. You either have acoustic guitar pickups and electric guitar pickups. Totally different market thing, yeah. Totally different market. I said, why can't we do both? Why can't we put electric guitar pickup in an acoustic guitar? Yeah. And so this is what we have. We have the cradle. Mm -hmm. So we have it in many versions, you know, humbucker, right, yeah. TV Jones. TV Jones are heavy, you know. <laughs> you know, single coils, you know, and then with mini, and then you can either put it in, take it off, or you can connect this internally. Okay. So it, it can be uh, no drill? No drill. In. Nothing. That's very cool. I like cool. the way you're thinking. <laughs> anyway. Okay, thanks. Sure. Anyway, appreciate it. I'm from California. I was born in India. So my family is doing the wood business for a long time. So I'm the fourth generation guy do lumber business. So I'm mostly focusing on Indian rosewood and cocobolo, ebony, African blackwood, exotic stuff. I'm currently supplying to Martin guitars, Fender, supplying to PRS, Sewer, Kiesel guitars, all the big factories like ESP in Japan, Warwick. So the big factories consuming my wood, I'm a wholesaler. So we have a facility in California, we mill a redwood, all kind of exotic stuff. 
So pretty much wholesale, you know, all kind of exotic stuff like for the guitars and violins and for uh, banjos and mand mandolins and do lumber business too. Yeah, it looks like you got some maple too, right? So high, high quality culture. Uh, that looks like the stuff that grows around here. Yeah, it's in the well, it's in the um, near to the Canadian border. It's a we need a special permit to cut down the trees. So it's a there are few people that do that, and the quality is very need to be very high. So like a high quality culture need to be there. So this this wood is very difficult to dry because there are more chance of getting crack and defects on it. So there need to be a lot of kill and dry, like a babysitting kind of job, sitting on the wood. You need to check the wood every day, how it's worked, so that's what it is. Beautiful, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, I'm uh, Mike Clark. I'm the son of Eugene Clark, uh, who passed away in December. Uh, I'm here with my sister, Hannah. Um, I'm from Fresno, she's from Portland. Uh, we have basically his entire estate, um, all of his tools, his woods, and even the last uh, guitar ever built by Eugene Clark is, is here for sale as well. So, A lot of stuff. It is a lot of stuff. It, it, it's actually been in storage uh, here in Tacoma, which is where he lived and died uh, since December. And uh, I'll tell you, the collectors and the builders are, have gone absolutely nuts for it. It's really been great. Does this go back to his New York days, maybe? Some of it does. In fact, uh, most of the woods uh, were from the 1960s. Uh, some of his tools were over 100 years old. Well, you're probably catching on to the fact that Eugene was absolutely a legend among uh, uh, American luthiers, and uh, yeah. we consider him one of the granddaddies of the American luthery movement. So, uh, he's, uh, he, he, some some people, he was like a guru, you know. Um, for me, he was just dad, so. Glad to see all this great stuff. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Okay, my name is J.B. Allright. I'm from uh, Dragon Plate. We're from upstate New York. Uh, we like to think that we're supporters of the luthery industry. We're engineers. We make uh, tools and we make a lot of carbon fiber reinforcements that are used to make instruments better. Uh, we sell pultruded strips. We sell carbon fiber D-tubes that reinforces and stabilizes the neck and improves the tone of the instrument. We also make the Gemini uh, carving machine, which we've sold at the GAL for many years. Um, we make a sound post tool, we're placing sound posts in violins, we make carbon fiber clamps. Oh yeah, you've got uh, a, and, a real deep throat on a lightweight clamp that way, huh? Correct, and, and we also work with a lot of high-end luthiers. We do a lot of experimental prototypes. Uh, I know uh, Dave Cohen presented on a mandolin project where we built him a carbon fiber neck. Yeah. So we do a lot of custom work. So we're, these D-tubes are being used in guitars and uh, uh, fiddles nowadays, right? They're being used in guitars, fiddles, mandolins, uh, and basses. Uh, Mario Lamar puts them in basses uh, and other, other bass builders, but I think of Mario. So, so um, yeah. what was the earliest GAL convention that you attended? What was the earliest one we attended? It's been a while, yeah. yeah. It's been a while. We we first came, we first came to the GL with our carving machine, yeah, yeah. but because we do carbon fiber, we started finding out that people could use carbon fiber in the instruments, yeah. and so that's when we got into the uh, pultruded strips, and we sell this to hundreds of luthiers. Yeah. And uh, but then a lot of the things that we do come because people ask us to solve problems. The sound post tool came because International Violin asked us to develop that mm -hmm. for school teachers. Well, it's got a little loop on it, huh? It it's a little loop, yeah. The way this works, this isn't for luthiers. This is for school teachers when the kid lets the cello dry out right. and the sound post falls out. And this allows a music teacher to rapidly reset the sound yeah. post. You don't want that music teacher impaling the sound post on the little uh, 
a little ice picky thing and sticking it in there. Exactly, and and we've sold a, a lot of these, 90% through International Violin, but a lot of them, and I would say the primary market is teachers, not luthiers. Yeah. Looks a lot safer. It's a lot safer, and it actually, when you go in through the FO, this is for a bass. It gives you pretty good visualization of the angle of the sound oh, post. Right. You can tell where you are. You can tell where you are, yeah, and you can control it. These are kind of high end. These are for very, very expensive violins because they're, yeah, they're very lightweight. Oh, yeah. So if you were going to fix a crack on a, on a Guarneri <laughs> or a right. Amati or some very high end violin, it, it's yeah. going to be less risk to the instrument. You don't want that leverage to snap the little soundboard off. Cor exactly, yeah. correct. So, but that's what we do. We're, we're engineers. We're, we're, not, we're not instrument builders, but my wife and I are both musicians. We love music. Sure. and. We're just here to make a contribution. Really. All right, appreciate it. Thank Thanks. you so much. Uh, Bill Hibden from St. Louis, Missouri, and uh, we brought mostly woods from Mexico. We have Zero Cody, we have Machiche, uh, we have Cataloche. Uh, we do some domestic woods, walnut, maple, and cherry. Uh, but our specialty is Mexican woods. Uh, we have a sawmill now in Mexico, and we're actually producing wood there, uh, uh, parts for guitars there. Uh, as well as our, our plant in St. Louis. We have a sawmill, uh, band, uh, horizontal band resaw, dry kilns. Uh, we also have a kiln in Mexico. So uh, we're happy to be here. Uh, we've had a good sale so far, and we look forward to uh, selling everything else. You've been here a few times, right? We have. We have, and it's always been a good show for us. OK, thanks. Okay, tell us your name, where you're from, and what you think about LeBron James. I am Eric Coleman. I am from Stuart McDonald, and uh, in our state, LeBron James is a very important person. Now what? I'm not a sports fan at all, so I just thought, you know. <laughs> and what uh, Luthery stuff did you bring here? Okay, a um, couple things that are new. One is uh, we have our new uh, router base here, and uh, now it's a plunge base. New little design there, so we're excited about that. That's going to be coming out pretty soon. Um, something else that's very, very exciting to uh, repair, guys, is uh, this heating element here is a new method of removing guitar necks for resets. So instead of uh, pumping a bunch of steam down in that joint, which might harm other things, uh, you, you push this down in, same thing, you drill in the same you know, first fret past the body, you get it into the joint, and then, uh, you know, usually about 20 minutes later, the, the heat from the element softens it up for really nice, perfect little. You don't put water down the hole? Sometimes you might put a little, like a little bit in a pipette just to create a little bit of moisture, but it's not near the amount of uh, steam that you were once pumping down in that joint. So this is uh, going to be coming out here in the next month or so. And it's, uh, it was kind of pioneered by a guy in New York named Ian Davlin. Um, and uh, he, you know, turned us on to the idea, and then we kind of refined it to where instead of using like heating elements in a big variac, you just put this thing on your soldering iron, and it, and it goes pretty well. You could probably make a cup of cocoa with that thing. You probably could. You could. You could warm your coffee up with that for sure. What's this big crazy thing with a half twist in it? <laughs> this guy is a, it's a tool for, a, you know, when you're using your Dremel, you usually have to have it your hand on it in one way. And so what this guy does is uh, secures it so you can clamp it into your bench vise and use it in other ways for you know cutting inlay or cleaning out you know mold lines or whatever. So. You can really get a hold of that thing. Yeah, you can really get a hold of that thing. And then um, if you put it in a sock, it makes a real nice blackjack. So that's another thing. Um, another cool thing is uh, this is a new rosette cutter um, that uh, it cuts, you know, consistent increments of one sixteenth of an inch. So rather than having to tie out, try to dial that little guy in, um, you just drop it in the hole and you're right on. Right. So uh, uh, it's a uh, more easily repetitive or uh, repeated results. And so that's getting ready to come out. So we're excited about that as well. Um, what else is new? I see you got the magic probe now, huh? Magic Probe, we've been carrying that for a, uh, pretty much since the get-go. 
And uh, what's cool about that is is he's constantly looking to upgrade it. So um, every year or two, maybe two, he comes up with a upgraded unit that's not just upgraded. Look, I mean, it's a fully different device. So got taller fins on the back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Taller fins on the back, big dualies. Now there's the whole neck jig thing over there. Let's take a look. The latest version of the neck jig um, is tremendous. The uh, old one is awesome as it was or is. Um, you know, it made of wood. It was subject to flex and twist a little bit here and there. And uh, updating to the new aluminum version, um, I really feel that personally. I'm doing the most accurate fret work that I've, I've ever done in this in this rig. So uh, the, the upgrade of it is, was, I think, very worthwhile. What's this gizmo? This is the Don McRosty design binding trimmer. So a router attaches to the bottom of it. Yep. And then the bit comes up. And then you run your binding in here. And uh, you can control the depth, the depth of it up to the cutter. Yeah, yeah, and so that uh, that's uh, kind of revolutionized the way people trim binding, and that's actually something Don designed probably 30 years ago, and uh, it was one of those that just sat on the back burner forever, and then finally it was uh, revived a few years back just because there was a definite need for it, so that's exciting. All right, thanks a bunch. Good to see you. Uh, Bruce Krebs from Lopez Island, uh, that is beautiful Lopez Island, and I brought uh, Koa, Myrtle, Clara Wallet, Sitka Spruce, and Maple sets for guitar. What's that like, good for making guitars and stuff? A and ukulele, that's right. Are you thinking of making a guitar? Well, of course. Show me some of this um, good looking stuff. That looks like a double cutaway uh, Telecaster or something. Yeah, it, it's got some run out, so I wouldn't use it on an acoustic guitar, but it's got a really nice color and flame to it. And then, you know, these are more straight grain, vertical grain, which would be suitable for acoustic guitars, but also very colorful and nicely figured. And then, uh, you know, there's some lower price, $50 to $100 sets that are not figured, but still decent material. You been to this show before? I have. Uh, When's the first time you came? It must have been 95. Yeah, it's been a while. <laughs> okay, thanks. Mm, I'm Chris Herod. I'm from Luthiers Mercantile. I'm coming from Windsor, California, and we are selling mostly tonewood, a wide variety of different species as usual. Try to give a smattering of cool different things that people don't usually get to see and handle okay. here. So uh, point them out. Well, we've got uh, we've got some waterfall bubinga, some myrtle. Those aren't too uncommon, but over here we have some figured oven call. Anyways, let's get to it. Figured anigre. Some Macassar ebony, Malaysian blackwood, grenadillo, a couple of uh, kaya and sapele, black acacia. Is that a for everybody? <laughs> is that a kazoo I see there? Yeah, well, sh of course, it's a fine hardwood kazoo. It's not freely exportable, unfortunately, but uh, you know we try to keep the kazoo a, a national treasure here for American luthiers. But no, that's a handle for our nut and saddle fire. This is what that is. So that's pretty cool. This is fun. People are doodling with your router. Yeah, that's the idea is get the hands on with this and uh, play with it and see how uh, nicely it operates. And uh, so it's been fun. We sold a couple and so everyone's happy. <laughs> okay, thanks. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jim Burton. I'm from Austin, Texas. And I brought a project that has three things I never did before. So I did an arm bevel, a sound port, and some engraving. So made out of bavinga uh, and then it has a sound port here and this arm bevel here is out of coca bolo why is it that long it's because that's the size of a head in the shop was that long of a piece <laughs> would i do it again that way no probably not but here we go i got it um, it plays good it's got little constellations on it uh, it's got the Little Dipper, the Big Dipper, the Pleiades, Orion's Belt on the 12th fret. Uh, and we got a horn toad here with the moon there. There's the engraving part. So uh, <laughs> here's what we got, what we got. And uh, it sounds good, and I have fun doing it. Okay, thank you very much.
Okay, uh, my name is Phan Sang Chan Thrang Kun. Uh, I come from uh, Bangkok, Thailand. Yeah. What do you got here? Uh, this classical guitar, uh, since my tradition, traditional style, seven fan strat and closing bar. And yeah, special uh, Loses 3D. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I made myself and, and also uh, Indian Lotus back and size. Yeah, top uh, German Sprout. And uh, we choice special for our show. This, yeah. Yeah. But not always a mix. <laughs> yeah. Okay, very good, thanks. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, I'm Steve Card. Moved here uh, to Port Angeles, Washington about three years ago from Oakland. Okay, um, this is my classical guitar, although I think of it as a jazz guitar. It's tapered on one side, on both sides. Yeah, well, sound port and an access port. That's how I glue the bridge on. Yeah. Well, how else would I get a clamp in there? Get in there from every angle. Yes, please. Uh, it's got a German tilting neck with the screw, you know, like that. And uh, it's really pretty conventional inside. Seven fan braces that focus up to the 10th fret. So from here and... Um, one, what I call an Oribe brace, some would have called an overholster, goes this way with the fans up underneath it. Stuff I read about in books, it seems to work. I've made, uh, I like making these. Uh, this one's a steel string version of the same thing. And this one's X braced with three fans down underneath here. And one finger on either side. Now this is entirely different. This is, uh, Got a bent top like a, a Neapolitan mandolin, a bow back, a tater bug, and uh, just a straight X, no fingers, no fans. Um, X meets right about there. That's what this is kind of a faux cutaway, because your hand really kind of contacts there. It sort of works. It's, you know, it's not that important. I rarely play up here anyway. Oh, this is, uh, I don't know, there's a fella that's been building guitars for a long time in Squim. His name's Pete Bartell. And he gave me this wood and enough wood to make about a dozen guitars. Wonderful, generous guy. He just wanted to make sure it got used. And I will be doing the same thing when my time is right. Yeah, we've seen Pete at our conventions many times over the years. Good, oh, to, good to see him. What a nice fella. Yeah, so... Um, I'm excited about it. This is the second one of these I've made. I think of it as uh, a jazz guitar. It's kind of an arch top in its own way. This is 12 degrees. This is to keep my hand off the top. You know, regular stuff. Not that unconventional. Um, it just takes courage to go up to the uh, belt sander and do that. Okay, thanks. Gnarly rasp and do that, yeah. So other than that, it's just woodwork. But you've got that courage. Yes, I do. My name is Jay Hargraves. I live in Des Moines, Washington, right under the jets of SeaTac Airport. And uh, what I brought with me was a, an electric bass, a Kasha model guitar, and a flamenco guitar that I built with Eugene Clark. And um, it's, uh, you know, I used James Candino's articles that were in the GAL about water staining and then French polishing. That's how I did the sunburst, water sunburst, French polished body. Yeah. It worked. I only had to read it about 50 times to, under, to, to think, okay, I can do it, but it worked. It, and I showed it to James and he liked it. So cool, you know. And the flamenco came out great. Everybody likes it. So your latest craziest thing is this 150-year-old uh, uh, style flamenco guitar. Well, let's see. This is like Lamborghinis and 34 Roadsters because this is patterned after uh, uh, a 34 Estesso, right? Yeah. And this is like Richard Schneider rocket ships, right. you know? You cover quite a range there, Jay. You know? I'm good with that. You What's know? the first GAL convention that you attended? 1980 with the giant guitar. Right, right. 
in San Francisco. World's largest guitar, Boogie Bodies. Yeah, I rode down there in a 67 Cadillac hearse that said Boogie Bodies on the side. How cool is that, right? And now I drive a tourist wagon that looks like a mini hearse. So, hey. It all comes around, man. Yeah, it does. <laughs> Thanks. You're welcome. Thanks. I used to be Bob Ham, but now I'm Robert Ham because I figured anybody named Bob has absolutely no credibility with the buying public. So I am Robert Ham, maybe the third, right? That's Antonio Stradivari, not uh, Tony, if you please. Get that right, please. <laughs> what you got here? Well, I've got two guitars, uh, and I haven't been building too long, but uh, I, they're both. Um, reasonable facsimiles of 1940 uh, Herman Hauser guitars and um, it, so I made the made the plans and uh, made a reasonable facsimile um, I I want you to know that Herman Hauser is rolling over in his grave right now when I say that but um, it's his misfortune that I happened on the scene <laughs> What's, what's the first GAL convention that you attended? 2006, I, and I got to tell you a story about that because uh, I didn't know you guys from Adam, you know, but I saw this on the internet and it said free entry. I looked at the price of getting in and I said, oh, forget that. So I came down on a Sunday, it was 2006, and I later found out that was the one that uh, Manuel Velasquez was at. Oh, God. So, you know, being a lifetime classical guitar fan, I knew who Jeff Elliott was. I, I talked to Jeff, and uh, I, I just, I, I, I was absolutely inspired. I said, I heard one of your instruments played by, I have no idea who, but I sure as hell remember the guitar. Can I say hello on, on camera? I don't know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, and he, he said, yeah, well, I, I said it, it, it inspired me, and, and so, on the spot, uh, he inspired me again, and I said, is this something I could do? And he says, oh, you, you have to. I walked out a, uh, an hour and a half later with a, a pile of wood from that gentleman there and another piece from those guys over there, and uh, I've never been the same since. That's how it starts, man. you got to watch it. Yeah, and so why didn't I know? Why didn't you let me know you were here years before that? I mean... Good, come on. <laughs> well, you're here now, right? I'm here now. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Okay, my name is Victor Johansson. I'm from Phoenix, Arizona, down where it's warm as hell. <laughs> uh, I brought two guitars with me. This is a prototype of my own design. It has a very unique bracing design. And um, this is number two. I built one. I figured it'll take me five to get it right. I was a little in a hurry on this one, and it didn't quite get finished for the show, but I brought it anyhow. How do you think it sounds? I think it sounds pretty good. The problem is, is the bridge is way too high. I misset the neck, and so I had to use a, a arch top uh, bridge instead of my own solid bridge. But I'll go home and fix that. How about this one? This one is my very first guitar when I started rebuilding. It's, uh, you know, I, I built it from a Stumac kit. I didn't have a lot of tools back then, so I figured a kit guitar was the way to go. So it's my favorite of all my guitars. I love this guitar. It has just an, it's just coming to its own sound. It's beautiful. I play folk music and do folk festivals, and this is my gig guitar. This is one I take with me. But I brought it so people can see, you know, how they hold up over the years. How old is this one? Ten years. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Okay, my name's Dave Arden, and I'm from Belfair, Washington, and this is my daughter, Olivia, and uh, this is her second convention. I came here in 2008 and then in 14. Um, we are just hobbyists. We're working on some ukuleles right now. Um, some of the stuff is scrap wood. Some of it's local wood that we've, you know, trying to pick up things from. This actually neck here I bought from the Eugene Clark estate, just a memento. Um, I used to come down and go to lunch with him every once in a while and pick his brain, but... Um, yeah, we're having a great time, and um, I brought, I, I picked up some uh, material from Scott McKee. He was a member here for a long time, and his is old data sheets and some of the old quarterlies. So I just bring them for, for people. Okay.
Okay, there you've got some, uh, when we printed the plans on large paper, we printed rather than uh, blue printed. Yeah, that's a, that, that is a rare thing there. I have one for like a D18 also, I think, or, or a, a Martin style guitar. But uh, yeah, he had he threw those in with the with the books and all. And the old data sheets in the binders. Not everyone may have seen those, but that's the way we did it for the first many years. Yeah, yeah. That it starts, I think, somewhere in 1980, and this kind of goes forward from there. But uh, yeah, they're pretty cool. So I see a uke with a maple top here. Have you done that before? No, that's that's actually a first one. I I uh, picked up a board from Home Depot and ran it through the bandsaw, and it had a little bit of figure to it. And the whole thing is actually from that same board. Um, <laughs> In the lumber yard, that's a defect. <laughs> exactly. So uh, we got a little bit of wood out of it. So this is our first project. We made a, we learned a lot of things on that one. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so we have the material to do another one here, and um, this one we're working on over here. This is uh, some cedar. I was tell just telling the fellow that was here. Um, a friend of mine has some property, and there's some hundred-year-old trees that were dropped right around the World War II. And when war broke out, the uh, loggers left and went to enlist. So he cuts fence posts and all kinds of things. So I, I pick through those and I make braces and tops and things out of it. Looks like you got a little D35 thing going back here. <laughs> Trying. Yeah, three piece back. It's like in some scrap wood that we had and kind of, you know, jointed them together and, you know, just a little practice. But yeah, I don't know about all the or ornamentation. I don't, I don't have that kind of skill yet. Yeah. Okay, thanks a lot. Sure. Brian Yarish, Castor Instruments from Broomfield, Colorado. I brought in two guitars that were made from a 319-year-old Engelmann spruce tree that died from a beetle infestation. And so we got the log and we chopped it up and realized that we couldn't just throw it in the wood chipper and so we decided to make some guitars out of it. So this stain that you see here is caused when the beetles bore into the wood, it lets in a little bit of moisture, then fungus grows and it kills the tree. So we've got a real problem in Colorado with pine beetles and spruce beetles and ash beetles and so we're trying to figure out a way to to save the wood and reclaim that and, and be able to use it for instruments rather than just throwing it in the wood chipper. So this is one of the guitars I made with that and I embellished, made you see what the Beatles actually look like. They're really, really small little guys, but they do a ton of damage to them. So um, I made this guitar with that top and then it's got a mesquite back and sides. An old mesquite tree again. This is uh, trying to use locally sourced woods and things like that rather than uh, some of the hardwoods that you can get. So is this a lefty over here? A lefty version, same thing, same back and sides, everything. Um, but I decided to try my hand at a little Jeffrey Young cutaway there, with a little bit of koa in there. So I like the look of that wood, the, uh, the stain in it looks good. Yeah, I like it. It came out pretty well. And that's not uh, that's not like spalt or rot or anything, right? It's coloration at this point. It's a it's a fungus that grows in the tree that ends up killing it. So it's a it's a discoloration, but from a tone perspective, it didn't really affect the tone. So we're like embrace the gray right you know make it it doesn't have to be jet white it can be kind of a little bit of gray in there right a little salt and pepper that's always a good thing okay thanks that's what the tree looks like when you cut it down all of that stain that's in there right and they're real tiny little specks of a beetle right yeah, and that's that's what's killing all of our trees, and this is the kind of damage that you see in the, the wood. Here. Yeah, that's right underneath. That's underneath the bark layer. Okay. It's just. So, uh, so the damage is in the sapwood, not the hardwood. Is that right? Yeah, the damage is in fr comes in from the from the from the bark, from the bark side, right? So when so, it's so like in these guitars, the uh, outside of the tree is to the seam. Yep, right? okay. exactly. It's usually the way because the tighter grains are on, on the outside. Because when the tree's growing real young, it's growing faster, so it's got a larger grain. And as it slows down, that's when the tighter grains. So that's why every even a straight straight up spruce tree, you're gonna see it's gonna be reversed like that. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Okay, I'm George Arai. I'm from Escondido, California, and I brought two guitars. Um, so the thought behind these guitars was to move the sound hole away from the main area of the guitar to where it's not so useful and to create more of a vibrating surface area yeah. and that should increase the bass response get more more volume so of air movement. So is that sound hole supported on the inside? Um, um, I see it's got a rosewood edge on it. Yeah I, I reinforced it there's another diagonal piece of uh, uh -huh. basically it's the same top material mm -hmm. 
and there's also an extra brace that goes across here, which actually terminates the X brace. Okay, yeah. So that kind of con constrains the motion of the top. And this one over here is a little different because it's a rounded cutaway. Yeah. I see yeah. So I tried one of each cutaway. What's the backwood on this one? Backwood? Oh, this yeah. this is uh, Amazon rosewood. And the top is Adirondack spruce. This one has yellow cedar. And oh, the top is yellow cedar? How do you like yeah. that for a soundboard? I thought it was a little heavy, but it seems to have mellowed out the sound, too. Okay. Yeah. And the back is an Indian rosewood. Nice. I've also laminated the sides to make them stiffer. Okay, yeah. Nice. Especially over here where they fly out, right? You want yeah. To, yeah, yeah, I've doubled it up here. Yeah. And then also the, um, I use the solid linings. Yeah. So just to increase the mass so that the top moves against something, surf something so uh, more massive, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm Zhao, I'm Zhao Hongbo. Uh, this guitar is made by my friend, Ma Chen. Yes, we came from Tianjin of China. Yeah, this one is, uh, we actually may finish it a few hours before we go to the airport. <laughs> so it's a, okay. yes. uh, Let's see the back of it. No. It's deep, huh? Yeah. Uh, <coughs> we just put some audio on the wood. Uh, this guitar is made, uh, made in two weeks. <laughs> so we don't have enough time. Yeah. What's this device? Oh, it's, uh, uh, it's a device to help guitar, electric guitar, uh, varying design. Yes, it combine all the uh, functions, some uh, like the different uh, values of the pulse that sing together. Yes. Okay, so you put uh, like different capacitors on it. To yes, it? yes. You can put capacitors on it, and the different method of triple bleed. Then you can decide which one you want to build into the guitar by running yeah. through here? Yes, you can, yes. So are these your tools over here? Oh, I bought them. The, the, the oh, you the bought them, them. okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you. I'm David Dolak. I teach at Columbia College Chicago. I live in the Chicago area, and uh, I teach college course on physics of musical instruments and of course the steel workers and I build of course for my own uh, enjoyment and to try to make some money. So I brought a uh, all mahogany uh, steel string guitar named Becky, named after my girlfriend from college who lives in Seattle now. She married somebody else named Dave, but she came down to see it anyway yesterday. Uh, Ikoa ukulele, unnamed, and then Mr. Hurdy Gurdy. Well, I've been coming here 20 years and I hadn't seen a Hurdy Gurdy yet. I figured there better be one sometime. So I made a Hurdy Gurdy. And it has a face, you notice. You see that it has a face. Now, Hurdy Gurdy is a drone instrument, so it's from medieval Europe. And so if I take off the drones, then I have two melody strings that I can change. But we're by this mechanism here of just uh, changing and shortening the length of the strings. But really what makes it fun is putting on the drone strings, which are an octave below and then a fifth above. So. Bring out your dad. Bring out your dad. So it's a folk instrument from medieval Europe. Medieval and uh, was used in village dances in Central Europe, France, Italy, Germany, Austria. Are the sides oak? The sides are white oak, yes. It's French polish, it's cedar. There is The wheel is walnut, walnut, cherry, maple bridge. You got some dental floss stuck in your strings. Uh, cotton, just cotton. And it helps to take the harshness out. Of the yeah. Yeah. yeah, you wouldn't want it to sound harsh. Worse. No, we wouldn't want that. Uh, it's rosin. You I was wondering it. how you got it to not sound harsh. Yeah. <laughs> Gee, I know, but um, yes, yeah, so it has a face. That's all I can say. 
Thank you. <laughs> One of my students drew a affectionate picture of it, which I carry with me wherever I go. You even have a picture of it in your picture of it. That's yeah. my, yes, that's the one I have on the website to show the face off. Thanks. Thank you, Tim. Okay, my name is Andrew Brake. I'm based in Florida, and we do musical instrument insurance and luthery insurance as well. We, um, we have several programs. We can cover anything from a student with a $3,000 instrument or even less up to a fully blown business with, uh, you know, all the tools and every possible <laughs> risk. Uh, yeah, but in the middle there is where the majority lie with, um, you know, collectors, uh, with more guitars than they can count, and uh, many are risks. Um, um, we just, we can cover anything you can come up with. Uh, can you insure a maker against uh, customers? <laughs> <laughs> We're working on that one. Because sometimes they don't do the right thing, you know? <laughs> I knew you'd find something. Okay, no. Humidity, that kind of thing? I mean, uh, are you insure against uh, humidity changes, things, that, cracks, that kind of stuff? Uh, aridity, yeah. aridity, okay, it depends on the, uh, in, in which case. String basses, we don't. Uh, case. Well, and cellos as well. Uh, why? Because they're prone to having aridity problems. But otherwise, uh, despite the fact that we, you know, we don't like people who, who you know, are cruel to their to their babies, uh, we we have been, you know, we cover most instruments against aridity issues. Thank you. No problem. And you're giving away picks, I see. Oh, I have. Yeah, I have. Take your pick. They are gauged. Is that right? Yes, they are. Yes, they are. Here's a blast from the past. I remember, De I bet Bond, you remember writing his name by hand many times, right? <laughs> How far back do you go with the GAL? I think 1979 in Boston. Oh, yeah. That was, I was in college, and there you were. And it's like, so now you're in Santa Rosa, it says. Yeah, yeah, Santa Rosa, making these things. What are they? Re resonator mandolins. Well, uh, that's exactly what they are, the resonator mandos. And when I... Uh, I, re I play a lot, and I played mandolin, and I played mandola, and uh, I dropped my mandolin, and I couldn't get it repaired, and I didn't know how to repair it myself, so I went to the store, and they sold me a broken resonator mandolin, and I fixed it up, and I built a new neck for it, and then everybody started asking me for it. Would you make me one? Would you make me one? So this is the fourth one I made. I made it for my wife, and it's made out of a piece of walnut from my dad's garage. And then that's the 20th one I made, and so far nobody's bought it, but they will. I'm convinced. It's got a guitar neck uh, as if you were capoed at the fifth uh, fret. Ah, okay. And a little pickup. And a little pickup in case you want to play rock and roll on it. Very cool. Thanks. Good to see you again, Tim. I'm Paul Micheletti. I'm from San Diego, and I was in the great position to have sold all of my instruments. Miracle of miracles. And so I figured I can't show up empty-handed, so I created a little demo of how I'm building rosette uh, tile mosaics. So these little pieces, I brought a couple of jigs that I use in gluing these things up. And Start with a cartoon here, and then uh, you, uh, rows and tiles and all? Cartoon is a picture I developed from a, my wife's um, Celtic cross-stitch book of all places. Did a little bit of modifications, and it winds up being a nice little uh, pattern winds up with a nice array of pixels and so I wind up having to build up a over here to this side is the 16 columns each one of these corresponds to a column in my pattern and those are all glued up in this little jig which I can thickness the veneers to the proper thickness glue them up and clamp securely so they all wind up the same thickness. Each log is the same thickness? Um, then I can bandsaw them up into thick slices and then hand plane them into thin tapered wedges. Oh, you actually make them tapered, eh? Yep, make them tapered and then I can glue them up in my tapered glue up jig where the center, the pivot is the same as the center hole of my rosette and the little fence here is even the same distance from the bottom of the rosette and here's a fully glued up one I can 
put in here the taper oop, and clamp them together with some clamps. Very cool. Thanks. You're welcome. Thanks for stopping by. Uh, Monica Esparza from San Clemente, California. I brought a Spanish guitar, classical guitar, and I also brought a tenor ukulele. Let's see the backs. The backs. Here we go. It's Alcoa. Alcoa with a uh, LR Bags 50 pickup. So acoustic electric. And I have yeah, Spanish guitar here with an Italian spruce top and Indian rosewood back and sides. Tell me about that rosette. That rosette, okay. It has uh, bloodwood. And it also has the, the herringbone. And I've inlaid uh, home oak and a couple black white dots to also kind of go with a slight discreet motif in the lower bout. I like to use all the natural colors of the woods, both in the uh, guitar and on the rosettes. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Steve Kennard. I'm from Nacogdoches, Texas. We're behind the Iron Curtain, but we call it the Pine, pine Curtain. <laughs> yeah. We brought with us uh, an OM model and also uh, our first double O. It's a prototype of our, it's, it's 120 years in the making. We finally got one done. Yeah, it's just a copy of a, of a Martin. But I love the way they could finesse a curve. You know, it's just beautiful shape. So we uh, had a customer that won one, so we thought, well, we'll do it. This is, uh, shall I just talk about the guitar? Okay. It's a uh, Sitka top, and uh, it is uh, Spanish cedar back and sides, and a Spanish cedar neck, and it's therefore fairly lightweight. How do you like Spanish cedar as a top, as a side and back wood? Well, it's uh, our second experience with it, and it works fine. It sounds to my ear like mahogany, mahogany lights, you know. Smells good. That's an added bonus. You get it warm in the car, and you know, you, who needs perfume, right? It fills the shop with a glorious fragrance. Anyway, all right. This is uh, my helper's third guitar in our shop. It's built with a Manzer wedge. We even talked to Linda, and she said, "Yeah, go ahead and do it." Uh, with our blessing, this is a double O shape. Uh, it's. Uh, Red gum or red eucalyptus, wood from uh, Australia. I should say Australia. Let's see. Sitka spruce top. We went kind of uh, minimalistic, but because it's uh, from from uh, down under, he used the Southern Cross and the peg head, and he used Ayers Rock there at the 12th fret with uh, the Southern Cross rising in the night sky. Yeah, that's fun. Hey, what's the first GAL convention you ever came to? 1992 at, uh, let's see, where were we? The Shrine to Music Museum in Vermilion, South Dakota. That's right. It was still the Shrine to Music Museum, right? Before it became the National Music Museum. Really? Okay, yeah. yeah. It was a great trip. We had it in conjunction with the Cat Gut Acoustical Society. Lots of fun. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah, good to see you again. Yeah. I'm Jeff Elliott. I'm from Portland, Oregon. What's this thing? Oh, this is a classical guitar that I made. Uh, in 1993, uh, it's about to change hands, and so we have it now uh, to spiff it up a little more than it looks like right now in order to sell it. Uh, it's a European spruce top, and it's an East Indian rosewood back and sides, a Spanish cedar neck, ebony fretboard, Brazilian rosewood bridge, and David Rogers tuning machines. Couple of dings, but it's aged well, huh? Yes, yeah, it's, it's a one owner guitar and it's uh, served very well. It's uh, uh, the, the, the guitarist that owned it, it was a traveling musician uh, as well as a teacher in a university, so it's toured the world a lot. What's the first GAL convention you attended? Oh my gosh, it was right here uh, in 1976, I think. 77, yeah. 77? Okay. That's been 40 years, Jeff. I know. Isn't that great? <laughs> I'm going for another 40. <laughs> no, it's, it's wonderful. It's um, so successful you can only do them every three years now. Right? <laughs>
Thank you. Okay. Okay, so uh, my name is Buddy DePaul. Uh, we're with DePaul Supply. We're an inlay shell company. We've been supplying luthiers with uh, seashell products. Um, we supply a lot of inlays from uh, rosettes to full set fretboards. We do a lot of custom stuff, so we do a lot of uh, names and just random pictures for people that are doing custom builds. Um, but my father, Andy, is the main guy that started the business. After we stopped building, he started the shell business. And um, as of now, we just kind of just supply all the luthiers and a lot of people with shells. What's the first GAL convention you attended? Uh, I think that was about 16 years ago. We haven't been here for the last two, but I remember when I was real little. I, was, I think I was in middle school, and my dad took me here. You grew up with a GAL. I think it was actually in 2000. About. Yeah, yeah, but I've known all the luthiers in this area since I was little and in the Portland area, and uh, we're starting to come back to this one, and we won't miss another show again. We've missed two or three, but we won't miss any more. <laughs> okay, thanks. Yeah, thank you, guys. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was reading, uh, I just finished um, Dick, uh, Dickinson's second book. Yeah. I love oh, that yeah, little part of yours. It was great. Yeah, yeah. I it. My name is Daryl Bjarnison. I'm from Creston, British Columbia, Music Spruce, Canada. We uh, are a Tonewood manufacturer. We cut Engelman spruce, um, guitar tops, violin tops, mandolin tops, brace wood. All, tops. Is it all Engelman? Yeah. We do play in cedar a little bit, a little bit in birch, but our real focus is Engelman just because of its uh, tonal property. So how far north are you cutting it? We source our logs from the interior of British Columbia from a fairly large area. We're actually located in Creston, which is the southeast corner of British Columbia. And uh, what's the elevation there? Of our location or our wood? It varies, uh, usually in feet. I mean, we're metric in Canada, so I'd say 1,500 meters, but that would be about, you know, 45 to 5,000 feet. That being said, some really uh, nice stuff comes from lower elevation if, the, if it's a thick forest and it's really striving for the, for, to get out of the canopy. The low elevation stuff can make some really nice wood, too. How, what do you think of the future supply of it? There's uh, definitely a limit to it, just by nature of the fact that most trees are, you know, 150 to 250 years old. So we have to steward it with care, which is uh, some of the point of why we're here. We want to see this stuff, the value maximized, and the end user uh, kind of a, you know, where it, it would otherwise go for pulp or something? Well, or two by fours, which I might almost shed a tear over. So. Well, this is beautiful stuff you got here. Thank you. Yeah, we've got some bear claw here that, that uh, bear claw, you very rarely see it. It's almost like a quilted maple such mix. Nice, such a nice color. Yeah. yeah, there's figure. So every once in a while, you get a treat like this amongst the, the hard work of producing the, the tops. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Good to be here. Well, my name's Bill Ellis, and I came up from the San Diego area. Uh, brought three guitars, uh, solid body, hollow body, and an acoustic. And I uh, uh, don't know what to say. What's the back of that acoustic? There you go. This is Koa uh, with a little bit of tint, a little red tint to it. I like to bring that color out a little bit. Thank you. Yes. Got an arm bevel? Arm bevel, indeed. Got to have that. Once you go there, you got to have it. And the sound port. And the sound port, yeah. Which unfortunately doubles as a viewing port. So people look in there now and it's not, you know. It's a whole new set of questions, right? Right, 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 yeah. So that, that leads to more questions. So is this a carved top uh, semi-hollow here? It's uh, a laminated. Laminated? Laminated semi-hollow. It's uh, cherry mm -hmm. and mahogany. Uh, the, the plies, cross grains, and the inside are mahogany. The, the cherry is on the outside. Use a little bit of yellow tint because I don't want the pink, you know, from the cherry to do the, uh, the sunburst. And um, so I'm pretty happy with that. Why don't you go to the pig head of this one? These are uh, fish. I um, paint them, oil paint, yeah. And then, of course, the, the shell is inlaid. Put some finish over that, or is that the top layer? No, that's uh, it's uh, shellac under it and shellac over it, okay. and then lacquer on top of that. Yeah, I see that. 
Okay, that's cool. Thanks. You bet. Thank you. Enjoyed it. Okay. Uh, name is John Kerrigan from Port Orchard, Washington. And uh, we have here uh, some guitars. Okay, let's start on that side. You turn this way. On this side. Which way? Okay. So this uh, is a guitar that I actually got this wood on eBay, which I rarely buy anything off eBay, but there you go. Kind of a nice piece of wood. And, uh, and then uh, we have a zircote. That's, a, that's Indian rosewood, by the way. Zircote, nice little piece of wood. And uh, this one's Honduran rosewood. Have a look. Have a look at this one. Nice Honduran rosewood. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Stuff's like glass. I dropped some on the floor and it actually broke. Uh -huh. Yeah, I mean, it shattered. shattered yeah. yeah. And then here we have a, uh, a uh, Weisenborn Hawaiian lap steel. Very nice. I like that tone. Hollow neck all the way up. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Made out of uh, wingay. Yeah. Wingay. Yeah. Is this your first GAL convention? No, this is my third one, actually. Yeah. And it's a lot of fun. I love this show. You guys, I love all you guys. Well, thank you. <laughs> yeah. And it's it's a whole lot of fun. I just I can't imagine a, I can't imagine anything I'd rather do. Yeah. Now there's an endorsement, folks. Okay, my name is Johnny Cage, and I come from Taiwan, and I bring the, this is, guitar is made by myself, and I drew the type here, mm -hmm. and uh, it's a very special one. Is uh, this is a signature of uh, me, Johnny Cage, and there is a Chinese name inside there is my name, and another one is uh, is uh, see the top, and uh, back side is uh, rosewood, and. Uh, Beautiful Bravo, mm -hmm. that's my work. How do you think it turned out? Uh, it uh, sounds very good, and uh, I like it so much. Yep. Right. You're making changes on the next one? Yes, uh, I'm being GAL, I learned so much, and I'll maybe adjust uh, about the uh, Bravo and uh, something else to do in the next, and uh, maybe three years ag and later, I'll come back again. Yeah. Okay, we look forward to that. Thanks. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Arsène Brossoutsfou. I'm from Montreal. Uh, we're from a school in Montreal. It's a public school in which there's a three years program to learn how to make guitars, uh, but also repairs and like starting a business and everything. So it's a pretty complete program. We have like bookkeeping and marketing to do. It's, it's pretty great. It doesn't sound like the United States. <laughs> no, but also our teachers are not like teacher. They're luthiers with 20 years, 30 years experience. And they come at the school to like show us their experience and show us how to do things. It's pretty amazing. And by coming here, we saw that we had amazing teachers because most of the things we saw here was like, oh, we, we do the same thing. We learned that. Uh, it's cool, and the school is in French too, so all our terms, we learned it in French, and but also in English. Yeah. So what did you bring here? I brought a parlor uh, guitar, parlor acoustic guitar. It's, um, it has paddock, paddock sides and back and side with a uh, European uh, uh, spruce top. Uh, the fretboard, the rosette, the bridge, the heel cap is all uh, ziricote. Uh, so I did that because of the grain looks amazing. Let's uh, see the back. Let's see the back. The back here is all paddock with uh, ebony, uh, Makassar ebony uh, bindings. I also have like a s small, uh, bind, uh, small ebony reinforcement there. How many instruments have you made? Uh, we made th we make three in the, in the course of the three years. We uh, first we make a classical guitar, which is a uh, Romanios guitar type. Uh, we all do the same with the same wood, which g gives us uh, uh, the opportunities to see what the same guitar with the same wood sounds different with how you make it. Compare directly to the Exactly. Okay. Uh, and then after that, we make a caustic guitar, which we brought here today. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, for this, we had the opportunity to either do a parlor or a uh, OM model. Uh, and this third one is like our final project. We can do almost anything we want, but it has to be a Spanish heel, Spanish built. Uh, so we both we learn both both uh, 
both type of heel and everything is pretty nice to know all that um, and also for the third one I did also Armenios to be able to compare okay. like the same guitar but different wood and, like the same uh, braces and everything so yeah who's our next student Right. Hello, my name is Morgan. I'm from Montreal. Just like Arsène said, we I studied at the Le Tricotteur Bruin in Montreal, and uh, this is my guitar. It's a parlor-shaped acoustic guitar with a red setter, red, red western western red setter top. Your name? Joey Copeman. Show us what you got here. Uh, well, this is my parlor guitar. This is my first acoustic guitar, uh, built in uh, Montreal, Quebec, Canada. And uh, it's basically an all uh, maple guitar. So the backs and sides and the neck is made out of maple. Yep. And uh, an Italian spruce top. And Italian? You weren't going to go the whole way and have a Canadian spruce top? Yeah, yeah. No, I just decided to, uh, to try a, a supplier that um, the director from our program suggested. And uh, really beautiful wood, as you can see. A nice bear claw, which I appreciate. And uh, good, beautiful quality wood. So how do you think it turned out, sound-wise? Uh, well, I went to the listening session, and um, I had a lot of people come up to me afterwards and uh, express that they thought it sounded great. I think it sounds pretty cool. Um, it's got a nice so bass range to the highs, uh, so it's really nice finger-picking. And it sounds nice when you're the player holding it in your hands, but when you're about 10 feet away, it sounds, uh, I'd say, almost divine. All right. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Hey, you're welcome. Take care. Uh, I'm Kim Bateau and I come from France, uh, well, Montreal, <laughs> finally. <laughs> and what did you bring with you today? Uh, one uh, acoustic guitar, uh, Parlo. Show us. Um, I'll take it. Yeah. yeah. We want to see the back. Ah, the back is uh, sugar and maple. And the neck is uh, maple big leaf. Uh, after purfling, uh, uh, I don't <laughs> binding. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, ebony, uh, like the bridge and um, fretboard, and that's it. Type of spruce. Sitka, sitka, yeah. How do you feel it turned out? You like the way it sounds? Yeah, yeah, it's a small guitar, but the volume is interesting. Um, is this your first instrument? No, it's my uh, fourth. Fourth? Yeah. Very good, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay, who okay. okay, I'm Tad Brown from Laguna Niguel, California. And these are my 17-inch arch tops. We got uh, European spruce, European maple, uh, ebony, obviously. It's a one-piece Brazilian rosewood bridge. Yeah. Let's see the back. Yeah. So how do you how do you like that one-piece bridge? It's way lighter, but is it a problem to adjust the action? Not really. Uh, you know, if it's the same as a flat top, if you want to lower, you just trim it down a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. It doesn't change a lot with the seasons? Or? Not so much. Uh, it doesn't move, you know, it's, it tends to be more stable, I think, than a uh, flat top just because of the curvature of the arch. I found that uh, it really actually doesn't move all that much. It, it may tend to rise slightly, you know, over time, but then you can just kind of trim it down a little bit. But, yeah. I mean, in my opinion, there's no reason to have those metal wheels that kill tone. And I mean, why, why would you need to be adjusting the action as you're playing it? It just doesn't make any sense to me. Do you uh, have you compared a uh, standard bridge to this bridge on these instruments? Just for yeah. uh, just out of curiosity. Yeah. Lighter, lighter is better. The lighter, uh, uh, you know, basically make it to be as light as possible, but still strong. And uh, yeah, in my opinion, that that makes better tone. Bunch of different materials, you know, ebony, uh, African blackwood, Brazilian rosewood. You can kind of vary the tone a little bit by uh, the material, depending on what you like. I like I like the Brazilian one the best. Some jazz players like the ebony. How about that? This other one is it a different wood or? On this one we have uh, Adirondack spruce top. That's uh, European maple back and sides. 
How do you like Adirondack for an arch top? I love it. It's great. I, I mean, I wish I could get more of it actually affordably. It's uh, a little bit tougher to find in uh, arch top thickness. Yeah. Is this your first convention, first yeah. GAL convention? Yeah. What do you think? It's great. You know, I've, I've been a member in the past. Uh, I've probably let my membership lapse for about 15 years or so, but uh, yeah. It's good to be here, talk to everybody, and uh, people are friendly. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, it's great. It, it, you ask anybody anything you want to know, and they'll tell you. So, yeah. Why wouldn't everything be like that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's what we all wonder, right? Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Hi, my name is Nick Gedra. I'm from Stillwater, Oklahoma. Um, so, a little ways from home right now. Um, so, anyway, I brought with me, uh, this is uh, one of my earliest projects, a uh, five-string banjo, um, open back, uh, white lady tone ring, maple neck. This, is, uh, this has been kind of my guinea pig through the, throughout the years. Um, I've been working on this for about five or six years, getting my start and stuff like that. Um, so uh, I've I've got uh, I've got this in open D tuning right now, just fifth lower. So that's pretty fun. What's the little contact things under the fifth string? These are the capo spikes. So you just you know if you wanted the capo two, or say if you wanted to play instead of D, that would be kind of clashing. So you can just slide those under. They're model railroad spikes. So that's that. Got some little, little D tuners on there, so you know. You know. Hey, but yeah, it's fun. How about these fiddles? These, uh, this is my second violin restoration. Um, is uh, my neighbor's old family violin. And uh, when she was moving away, she was getting up in age, and she, she said, Well, you know, do you want this? This is my grandmother's, and she played in an all-girls orchestra in the 1920s and 30s, and then no one ever played. So uh, her name's Agatha, the, the, her name. Um, and so uh, I've just been kind of working on this off and on. Uh, I mean, I've had it completely apart, neck reset, you know, any crack repairs. Uh, so this is, a, uh, have had this thing together for about five years, and it got, uh, got knocked over by a by a sound guy and I had to reset the neck again so that was that was a sad day but but it's back together again that happens to strads too oh yeah and then uh, this is just another project I've been working on this is my third restoration you know crack repair uh, you know neck reset bushings um, back home I I usually take a couple fiddles with me for, this one's half step down just for those guys that play in weird keys so I just have them have this one half step down. And then you got a telly over here. That's uh, on the other end of the spectrum, huh? Yes, sir. Uh, so this is, uh, I actually just finished this a couple days ago. It's a Les Squire, uh, Esquire style, really. Um, and so uh, I've been, you know, messed around with Luthery for, since I was probably about, oh, 13 or 14. I'm 20 now. And uh, so I, this is my first that I've really carved everything out, you know, maple neck, ebony fingerboard, pine body. Um, you know, I'm, I made as as much brass parts as I could in order. This is Armadillo and Glendale and stuff like that. Made the little jack plates and stuff and the pit guard. And I just whitewashed it and put a sealer coat on. It's fun. Okay. Not a whole lot of sound coming at it. You're right. Nice big knobs. Uh, yeah, those are from an old Crown amplifier. I was going in the trash at the store. I work on it. It's louder with a big knob, you know. I, I think so, and it's got a harmonic design pickup in there too, so it's super responsive. So it's a lot of fun. Very cool stuff. Thanks. Well, thank you. Well, my name is Brian Griffin, and I live in Bellingham. And, and mostly, I make 
regular ukuleles. Mm -hmm. You know, this, just, just ukuleles. Yeah. But uh, I have a couple of cute ones. This is a family. I call these pine cones. Those aren't pineapples. Okay, they're yeah. pine cones because they're all made out of Pacific Northwest woods. And, uh, you know, they, and I carve the back. They're kind of kind of different. What's the neck on this? Well, the, the, the necks are all walnut. Oh, okay. I've had the wood for 35 years, so I'm cheating a little bit. So what's this uh, unusual thing here? <laughs> this I call son of gut bucket. I used, years ago, I used to play the gut bucket. And, you know, playing with a bunch of ukulele players, you really need a bass. Oh, yeah. So I tried to figure out how can, how can I make a bass. I didn't know anything about it. So I bought cello strings because I figured they were about the right length and about the right sound. Mm -hmm. And I designed the building, the business, the, the instrument around the strings. So it's uh, it's really been fun. So it's a bass member of a of a uke group, eh? Yes, exactly. And it's a one octave bass. I heard a guy play this thing the other day, and he got a lot out of it. Well, uh, didn't he? Yeah. He came by here one day, uh, or that day, yeah. and he saw that, and, and uh, he was kind of a different-looking man, you know. He w and I thought, where did he come from? But he asked if he could play it. So he, he stood here on the floor and put on a show for about eight minutes, and then the fellow next door that you just talked to loaned him a bow. And so oh. then, then he was bowing, and my goodness, I immediately knew this guy was good. Turns out that guy could play, huh? So, oh, man. So, so he asked you if he could play it in the concert. I was thrilled. So, uh, but anyway, it's a fun instrument, and it was fun to make, and it's typical of maple, and the back is carved. So, and it's got a, got a pickup in it. It, I st the back is started out as a. Th it's not carved very deeply. Uh, the, the back started out as a three-quarter inch plank or two of them. So anyhow, very cool. Thank you. Thank you. Ah, Jack Johnston, Livermore, California. We got two uh, high-tech guitars here. Uh, they're high-tech because they've been acoustically optimized to produce simple harmonic motion. And we do that by uh, giving them, uh, uh, making them uh, isotropic in regard to stiffness and mass. And we double, ch uh, we check on that by generating the uh, ring and a half mode of the Shaladi mode patterns. Shaladi did his experiments with plates which had isotropic materials. So when we get his ring and a half mode, we know we have isotropic properties in regard to stiffness the mass. I see you got a picture of Don Bradley there. Did you know Don? He built my signal generator for me. That's why I can do this kind of work. Yeah. I need to have it. I drag that. I drive that five-inch speaker with it. And Don built that for me. Yeah. Yeah. How about this other guitar here? This, uh... Well, they've both been tuned the same. Uh -huh. uh, and, and according to the differential equation for simple harmonic motion, uh, these are perfect oscillators of of, uh, Do you like how they sound? Yeah, everybody likes it uh, because they got sustain. But uh, along with this activity of the top plate, mm -hmm. we get a new problem. Yeah. The steel strings now act like files and file grooves in the saddle. We need harder saddles. Okay. <laughs> okay, thanks. Now this one over here, this is a purple heart, a cedar top. And this one is the last of Mohicans. This is the team is the first shipment of stump wood that came in when uh, they got permission to cut the stumps. And uh, I went through about 50 sets to find that one. And, uh, and Engelman top. And I didn't spare anything on this. Got uh, pile abalone everywhere, gold tuners. Everything is high end. Alrighty. Looks and good. Sounds good too. Right. Thank you.
My name is Larry Stamm. I'm from Dunster, BC, which is in the middle of nowhere, about halfway north in the province. Uh, I brought four mando thingies, ranging from uh, mando cello, Suzuki, <laughs> octave mandolin, and mandola. And uh, just arrange, I don't know, two red cedars. That one's carved. Uh, the other ones are. Uh, Spruce on the top, Engelman spruce, flat. See, top. you're using an X brace on the back. Yes, and a lattice brace okay. on the front too. Uh, I got my bracing pattern here, which people, all the luthiers, have been interesting to talk about that. Now you've been to GAL convention before, right? Yes. Yeah, this is maybe my fifth or sixth one. The first one was 1995, so. The only thing that's changed is my hair is grayer, <laughs> so is my beard. <laughs> uh, we don't mind around here. Uh, you know, you're in good company. Oh, uh, thank you. Uh, I don't know what else to say about these other than... Uh, and you cut some wood, too, right, don't you? Yeah, I cut wood, uh, mostly spruce and red cedar. Uh, and it goes all over. All righty, we're going to move along. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> hey, John Partram from Seattle, Washington. Um, I build guitars using Trevor Gore's, um, Aust he's an Australian luthier's methods. Um, these three guitars all have falcate braces, which are um, sickle shaped braces. Oh, yeah, you got a picture here, right? Yeah, I got the got a demo. Yeah, right, right. yeah it, falcate shaped with carbon fiber reinforcement. I use the same um, basic. Um, falcate bracing pattern for both classical guitars and steel string. I vary the width of the tops and uh, the height of the braces to get the box residences to be where I want them to be. But, um, is that working well for you? It's working really well. And these uh, instruments are all braced that way? Yeah, all three instruments are braced that way. Um, th this, they, these two both have bolt-on, bolt-off bolt, bolt -off decks, so they have removable necks. Um, so in, in this guitar here is, is basically um, a copy of the medium style Gore steel string. So it's built to his plan that he, sell, that he gives in the, in the book volumes that he has. Um, and th this guitar is a falcate brace, but it's built in the Spanish style with um, built on a solera with a, a, a dome. And it, you think that's a good combination? This one worked out pretty well, and, and I, I found if I hand this one to a classical player, sometimes they have to wash their hands. <laughs> they're doubtful. Yes, they're doubtful, but this one, it has sort of the weight of a classical guitar, and it, and it, and it feels like what they would expect, so they're, they're not automatically biased by the... It calms them a little bit. Yeah, and I don't tell them about the bracing pattern underneath. <laughs> good, good strategy. Thanks. Okay. All right, I am Jay Lichty from Tryon, North Carolina. And uh, I've got four instruments here this time. A couple of guitars. This is a, our medium jumbo guitar with a sinker redwood top. And uh, what would you call it? A bird's eye maple back and sides. And uh, thank you. Sound port and all that? Yes, got the side sound port. And um, I'm sure that you can't really hear much. <laughs> Sometimes hard to, be, hard to be sure under yes, the circumstances. Yes, uh, this is a baritone-sized ukulele with an Engelman top and Granadilla back and sides. It's also I got I use side sound ports in pretty much uh, all of my. And these are the ones with the uh, with the port, uh, the extended part in them, right? The uh, they're, uh, yes, they're not like, just a hole. Yeah, it's the hole. Uh, I, I did a demo of this on the la in the last guild on how to do that. So. And another medium jumbo. This one with the bear claw sitka top. And sapelli, figured sapelli back and sides with some uh, coca bola binding. Armrest bevel. Just things to try and make them pretty and comfortable too. And this, this ukulele here is, is a, one of, a project um, that I'm working with six other builders, uh, five other builders. It's called Luthiers for a Cause. Mm -hmm. And we're all building a ukulele out of 
the, the tree walnut and uh, the Lucky Strike uh, spruce. Mm -hmm. And um, we're building them and raising money for the Ukulele Kids Club this, oh, this, okay. this time. And a um, very exciting project. We hope, uh, hope raises some good money and awareness for that organization. Very good. Okay, I'm Howard Replogel. I'm from Chehalis, Washington. And uh, I've got a uh, tenor ukulele mm -hmm. and a, uh, with, that's uh, um, a genuine mahogany. Mm -hmm. and I've got a concert pineapple that's uh, coca bolo and, and uh, eucalyptus with, uh, with uh, leopard wood uh, fingerboard and peghead uh, veneer. Eucalyptus top? Eucalyptus top. How do you feel about that? Well, it sounds pretty good. It, it, it's the one Kimo played in the demonstration, so it, it, uh, it's okay. Um, this Here's is a traditional looking one. Soprano. This, this uh, rope binding is my, I was making this kind of rope binding and was running out, so this is my own take on rope binding. This is a bass. It's, uh, it's a lot like a baritone, except different bracing and uh, bass strings. It's tuned just like a bass guitar. And uh, something unique about my ukes is they, uh, I use laminated linings, no kerfs. And so the, the rims are really rigid before I put on the top and back. So you've been to a few GAL conventions, eh? Yeah, this is my second. Everything OK? Oh, yeah, I love it. Okay, great. Uh, Peter Thorson, I'm here from Eugene, Oregon, and I uh, just brought three classicals. Been building only classicals and just been trying to learn how, learn what the process is, learn how to make them sound good. Uh, Looks like this in cedar. Yep, one cedar top, two spruce, sort of a Canadian spruce, uh, all fairly sort of inexpensive for my early pieces here. This one's all sort of free wood, rejected from other folks, so uh, that's been a fun project. Uh, and otherwise, really just trying to brace them consistently. I've uh, been learning a little bit from Jeff Elliott, and he's been sort of really helpful thinking through some of the stuff that I don't know and getting to the point where the box comes together and actually works. Your rosettes have a lot of variety. Uh, yeah, and to some extent, some of this maybe is an experiment phase. Uh, there was a lot of like laser cutting and filling with resin and then recutting and doing more normal inlay kind of work and that kind of thing. Um, so I think some of this will translate hopefully to later work, but I think right now it's the next batch has none of these elements in it. So keep going forward and maybe revisit later. <laughs> okay, thanks. Yeah, absolutely. My name's Clayton Pledger. I'm from Portland, Oregon. And I've got three guitars today. They're all pretty much uh, based on traditional flat, stop, flat top steel string guitars. Um, this is kind of a, my sloped shoulder D, um, made out of Sitka spruce and African wingate with coca bola rosewood bindings and backstrip and maple purpling. And, you know, I guess it's kind of a, it's a, it's a thinner bodied guitar, so it's um, got a good projection, good for flat picking, also good for finger style. And then this is kind of based off of my, um, this is based off of like original Dreadnought 12 fret, so like the old DS models. Uh, it's got a hand rub sunburst, tobacco sunburst. Um, real lightweight, made of mahogany, and a hand cast pit guard. And here's my auditorium model, triple O, short scale, um, with, you know, like a a Sitka spruce, also African wingate, curly maple bindings, and an old old style bridge uh, made of African blackwood, and a ha hand cast pick guard. So, what was your first GAL convention? Uh, was there a convention in 2003? Uh, there was one in 01 and one in 04. It would have been 04. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah, I was just kind of starting out. I, I think I started in about 2001, 2000. So I was a uh, young guy looking for inspiration and found a lot of it. <laughs> All right, that's good. I yeah. like that. That's, yeah, I, I, yeah. I like that. I could use, make a slogan there, right? There you Come go. Come looking for inspiration and find it. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. 
Okay, my name is John Park. I'm from Summerland, British Columbia. And uh, these are, this is a classical guitar uh, made in the traditional Spanish style of the 30s, 40s, 50s. And uh, this is a flamenco guitar made in the southern, southern Spanish style of uh, Cordoba and, and uh, modeled after a comp composition of medley of guitars, shall we say, from the, from the early 20s with a mother of pearl uh, rosette from reclaimed uh, mother of pearl from an old Italian mandolin. And that has a, the old traditional rounded heel. And traditional Spanish cypress and spruce and a flat wing, what they call a pop popsicle stick bridge, which is common in the early 20s. How do you like it? Would you do that again? Oh, yeah, sure. <clears throat> well, it entertains the troops. <laughs> it, so it, it sounds like it looks. And did you play this last night at the, uh, at the Flamenco open mic? Absolutely. And uh, this um, <clears throat> Simon showed up you didn't. You, anyway, Simon showed up. The player just drifted in out of the blue. Uh, it turned out to be a great flamenco player from Ottawa, Canada, and he just he was his eyes were spinning all night long. And with guitar lust had set in. Unfortunately, it exceeded his bank account, but we'll we'll work on it over time. <laughs> we'll talk, right? We'll talk. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Dan Biasca from Portland, Oregon. Um, build classical and steel string guitars, uh, and teach guitar making. What you got here? What have I got here? This is uh, actually from the Guild Plans for the LO, and I put my own patented X bracing design on there. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> What's the wood? Uh, this is Oregon Myrtle, yeah. as opposed to California Myrtle, which is entirely inferior. <laughs> and Engelman Spruce Top. And a How about rip off of Gibson design. <laughs> yeah. How about this one here? Uh, classical guitar, uh, European spruce, and Indian rosewood. Um, not much to say about it except it's an awesome guitar. Come buy it. <laughs> okay, I'm uh, Dave Vanderwill from Parker, Colorado. Um, this is my original design. Uh, I started with an OM template. I uh, kind of tossed that out the window. Narrowed in the waist, narrowed in the upper bout, so that way it cradles really nice over your leg. Mm -hmm. I have a really nice lower bout, um, more kind of like a drum cymbal kind, kind of technique. Um, I have a center point right between the G string and the uh, D string, uh, so that way when you strum it, you get a really nice uh, equal equal sound. It kind of goes to the sides and it kind of comes back. You get a really, really balanced sound out of it that way. Um, this is my 612 series. Uh, we're going to start with the botanic with this one with the color rosette. I uh, had the idea just to kind of create an instrument that kind of looked like it grew out of the earth naturally, very organic. Um, these two is a uh, original guitar model and an original guitar mahogany model. Really wanted something that was kind of out in the market and make it really marketable. Um, kind of a bluegrass, country, heavy blue, something that you get on a pick with. It's not going to stumble over itself. And then I got a cedar top model, which is a Santa Fe model. Nice and light for kind of like a... Uh, a finger style kind of instrument. How long have you been making guitars? I've been making uh, guitars since 2012. Mm -hmm. uh, I started at Red Rocks Community College. I met Robbie O'Brien up there. Oh, yeah, yeah. And then ever since I met Robbie, I've been studying underneath him privately in his shop. I've taken two classical classes from him, a uh, steel string, uh, a full steel string class. And then I've uh, done a couple of tops with him. And then I like uh, trying, uh, whenever he has a free uh, free time, I try to uh, go over to his house and see if I can get a little bit more advice from him. Do you drink coffee? Uh, absolutely. <laughs> and I also bought those hidden chakas in the basement. Okay. All right. Don't tell him I said that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. I get somebody demoing my product. Yeah. <laughs>
Hi, my name's Ethan Muter from Beaverton, Oregon, and uh, I like variety. I started out building solid body electrics, and I'm kind of using my solid body techniques for stuff like this. Thank you, that was actually perfect timing. Uh, this is a solid block of wood, and I did the, uh, the chambered style, like the base that I have here, and uh, redwood top, mahogany, trying to go something a little different. It's kind of pattern after uh, like a Renaissance Rebec, but with modern appointments. You can you know, play it regular style, whereas a Rebec's a bull back. I just like trying different things. What you got going here? Yeah, it looks like you got a plan there. Thank you. Um, this is a solid body electric violin. So one solid block of maple and then I've got some nice figured babinga for the uh, fingerboard tailpiece. And I'm gonna use a pickup on it, or yeah, trying to figure out what kind of pickup I want to use there. Um, something under the bridge, something integrated into the bridge. I don't know. I'm trying to figure it out. That's why it's not complete yet. Okay, thanks. <laughs> oh, John Serbert from just south of Bellingham. It's called Bow, which means the boonies. Okay, I'm a basement type uh, artist. Well, I've got a banjo that I made. Uh, inlaying was my obsession. I think Robbins was one of the books that I learned the technique. So, but this one's designed off of. Uh, I live near Chuckanut Drive, and these wild honeysuckles grow along the rocks, like for a one week period. And so then I inlaid this bumblebee at the top, and it was made from my grandma's button box. Big old button box, jeweler saw, scrimshod, pretty nice. That looks like a dock bridge. And that is a dock bridge. I'm trying to adjust the, what do they call it, the intonation and everything. By, like it's a, it's a uh, wooden tone ring, so it keeps it soft, even though it's the plastic head, high tension plastic head. But I really like carving, so as you can tell, we have Mr. Wood Elf and then we have Mr. Harmonica Player, because you're never without accompaniment if you carve your own accompanist. Yeah, that's right. But no, I've been playing banjo for 50 some years, so. And this is just like curiosities. How about this thing? It looks a little. Uh, the second one I've ever made, the ukulele. And it's, uh, you know, tenor, 17 inch scale. Again, the references are inlay with that. The Portuguese man of war was the first cultural influences in Hawaii that brought the ukulele to Hawaii. That's the story I've got. That's the one I'm passing along. Yeah. Nice. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Have a good evening. Uh, I'm George Thomas from Bellingham, Washington. Been building about 12 years. My special interest, smaller body guitars for smaller people, smaller hands, people with arthritis. I do shorter scales so they can make stretches. And um, people that want a little more comfort, I put on this. And I put it on free because I just think people need to protect that nerve in their arm. For the few who practice many hours every day. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I make nylon and steel string, a lot of classicals, and then a lot of these small body in nylon and steel string. What's the top wood on this one? This is western red cedar. But I was trying to make a point, you can have white grain and still have it sound good. Because this is very loud and projects well too. So, yeah. Now what's the uh, back and side wood here? My favorite, koa. So this is a wavy koa, which is more dense than figured koa. Uh, so it's heavier, and it just makes for a better, better sound all around. And this is Johnny, which is wind in Hawaiian. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay, well, my name's Rob McAllister. I'm from Reardon, Washington, which is just outside of Spokane. Uh, and what I brought, well, my first instrument was this classical here. Uh, built that it's... Uh, Indian rosewood with a, an Engelmann spruce top. Looks like it's got a complex shaped sound port. It does. I, uh, I carved this uh, scorpion into the side here. Uh, it's a very unorthodox uh, classical, you know, fret markers, inlay on the, you know, so some classical players kind of look at me cross-eyed, but I made it for myself, so. Now you got some nice turquoise on this one, looks like. A turquoise yes. colored. This here is a, a tenor ukulele. Uh, I inlaid uh, some 
this is a reconstituted stone. I actually purchased it from LMI. Uh, so I cut it out and laid it into the, you know, for a, you know, for a rosette. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a bear claw uh, Sitka spruce, a very, very stiff, stiff one. So I went pretty thin on the top. Uh, the wood on the back is a uh, curly pine mud out of uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, I was quite taken with the curl on this and yeah. pleased with how it turned out. What do you got here, laser cutting? Uh, this here is, uh, is also a tenor ukulele. I built both of those at the same time. Okay. Uh, the inlays were purchased from uh, Perflex or Petros Guitars. Yeah, right. uh, and I really, I, I like what they sell. I, they, they want a pretty penny for them, but they do, you know, they do some very detailed work and uh, it really dresses up an instrument. Yeah. Uh, this is also a Sitka spruce top. Uh, this is Mexican bacote back. Uh, and I, I use the Aguilla red strings on it. I'm really like uh, quite, quite pleased with the sound of those. What you got on the end there? On the end there, that is a uh, guitar that uh, I built in Robbie O'Brien's shop. Okay. I, so I flew down to Colorado and uh, built this. It's, uh, it's fairly standard. Uh, Wood. This is what Robbie always uses for his steel strings. You know, you've got your Indian rosewood, you've got your curly uh, maple bindings, uh, Sitka spruce top. So fairly standard. I went a little wide on up here in the neck because I like playing finger style. So I just kind of customized that build. And, uh, so these are I've four of the five instruments I've ever built. <laughs> so well, they're looking pretty good. Well, thank you very much. Okay. Thanks. Well, uh, I'm Federico. I was born in Mexico. I have a home in the United States. Well, I own a home in the United States, but it doesn't own me. So I can be found anywhere at almost any time. So I have uh, with me the most magnificent book ever written about the Spanish guitar. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be part of this project, and I have some very, very fine marquetry from a, a De very dear Russian friend who I uh, helped uh, start an international business in the Soviet Union back in the dark days before internet and uh, international trade that was done easily. So, What was your first GAL convention? Boy, this is very tough. This was uh, shortly after the egg cracked and then uh, with my egg tooth, my beak, and I uh, i think it would have been 95 when I first exited the shell. Were you wearing a t-shirt that said, beer is God? Beer is God, yes it is. Oh my God, you were, you worship in the same church that I do. Well, I have seen the icons in that church. Yeah, well, uh, have you seen the original with the rest of the accoutrements? I don't know. You haven't seen the cow helm? Oh, I uh, watch your mailbox. Watch your mailbox. It's coming. It's coming. In fact, it may actually be in my presentation. I have. You're on a slippery slope now. You are full of surprises. I'll give you that, Federico. Well, I guarantee I will excite every neuron and every connection of that neuron in your body tomorrow morning on time, 10.30 a.m. Very good. Thank you. It has been a pleasure being here. Dan Wilson, Newcastle, Washington. This is my third, I think, GAL convention. And I started with the Martinez 1816 plan, which is on, there on Gary's table. But uh, I ended up selling one to Gary, and he said, uh, I'd kind of like to make one. And so he has my forms now, and I've gone on to making all kinds of other things. Uh, mostly recently ukuleles and I've kind of I'm interested in early instruments and I'm interested in the transition to modern ones and I'm interested in local woods so I can explore on all of those things because I'm one of the I have great respect for those who need to make instruments for their living and I fortunately do not so I can explore but it's fun to share the ideas with the people that are here but uh, I've been, this, this one is all Madrona, for instance. This is all Douglas fir, just to see how it worked. What do you think? Uh, the Madrona is too stiff, or too dense. Right. 
not, or not stiff enough to the density. Okay. Uh, it's a little bit muted sounding. The, the Douglas fir actually works very well. Chemo played that today, and, it, and I thought it sounded great. Uh, they're all different. The cherry one I like perhaps the best. That was from a friend's cherry tree that blew down in a windstorm a few years ago. Uh, that worked out very nicely. Uh, I had a, a friend, another student of Elizabeth Brown, who ha is an arborist, and they had a dogwood tree in their yard, oh, yeah. which died with the blight. Pacific dogwood Pacific or the Korean? Dogwood. Yeah, Pacific dogwood. And this tree had a trunk that was almost three feet in diameter. They left it as a wildlife snag, gave me the branches, which were... So, and then she asked if I would make her an ukulele, which I did. This is the one, this is not it. Um, that, likewise, I think suffered a little bit from dense uh, top, but it's a, it's, it's a very nice instrument, very beautiful. Uh, this one I made with a spruce top, and I made it as an eight string, because that's essentially a Renaissance guitar. This is Elizabeth's Renaissance guitar behind it for comparison. It's the same thing. I tuned it with, or set it up with, with uh, ultra-light strings, okay, yeah. but with the, the Renaissance guitar, there's subtle differences the way the uh, Hawaiian eight strings are done, but this is a Renaissance guitar, basically. Yeah. And I really like that. It came out very nicely, and I can play the Renaissance tab on it. Well, you can play it on any ukulele. Yeah. Wow. This one, this was a whim in between. It's a stringed instrument. It has yeah. strings. Uh, but that's a Hawaiian pahu drum, a mini version. I made one, and my grandson liked it, so I thought I'd make him one. Yeah. He uses it as a stool to get to the big one. And this is, uh, this is the uh, Sopranino that I made. I took a Martin 1940 plan, scaled it down 84%, and I made it like the uh, harana, which is hollowed out from a block of wood. Oh, and I figured, yeah. th so it's all one piece, uh, all right, yeah. one piece uh, big leaf maple. Old school. Yeah. And uh, it, it plays very well if you can get your fingers in there. I think it sounds a little bit like a transistor radio. <laughs> but uh, Kimo actually came by and played it, and he made it sound really good and didn't drop a beat with the small frets. But anyway, so as soon as my grandson uh, won't use it as a projectile or to chew on, teething ring. Or, paddle, perhaps? Yeah, or a, oh yeah, it would work okay as a paddle. But I was thinking what he'd probably do at this stage of his development is fill it up with small objects and then shake them out. <laughs> and he's really fascinated with tuning pegs. He really would like to get his hands on those and, and turn them around and see what they do. Uh, yeah, as many times as possible. So that's sort of where he's at. So uh, with some care, this is this is his to be played with my son, and that's his. The fun thing about that was because that came from a post in his house, which he took out, and uh, that was that was just fun. And that's native, our native hazelnut, which is actually a very nice wood. It's pretty hard, surface hard. It's it creeps, so it, I tried it on an ukulele, which I had here a while back, and within just a few months, the bridge just rolled, and uh, I had I ended up using a fabricate a bridge doctor essentially to fix it, and it worked, and it, it plays fine. It sounds exactly like a Martin ukulele that my friend has, and but I won't make a top out of it again. <laughs> so it's important to know, right? Yeah, it is. I think so. Anyway, so they, they've all been, uh, they all tell you different things. I think I'm likely going to settle in on the best of these choices. And, uh, you know, like the, the, the heavier woods didn't do so well on this one. Glad to see Totoro there. I'm a fan. Oh, good, good. Yeah, so my daughter, when I made the first Martinez guitar, it had two little knots in the back that I left on because they looked like eyes. And I thought it looked like Gandalf or something. It just, it was cool. And she said, Dad, you need to name it Totoro. Totoro, what's Totoro? That's where I learned. And she says, because the eyes look like Totoro's eyes. And so I learned this. And so I said, okay, so all these, Totoro was a forest spirit. So I informally call my instruments forest spirits, which I think sort of fits, kind of bringing to life the, the spirit in the wood. Uh, 
and if I were actually to try to go into business with that as a registered name, I'm sure I'd get sued. But <laughs> Disney owns it now, so you'd really be in trouble. Right, yeah. So anyway, that's just informal. And if they want me to take off the, the labels or something, which have sort of a, a, a half you know, half screen image of Totoro, I probably have to do it, but don't tell. <laughs> okay, thank you. Anyway, thank you. Enjoyed it again. I'm Mike Doolin from Portland, Oregon, and I have a fairly wide variety here today. This is a 2012, I believe, harp guitar, uh, cedar top, or sorry, redwood top, Peruvian walnut back and sides, boxwood binding. This instrument was originally a six string neck and seven subs. Yeah. And then I switched to seven string guitar, playing seven string guitar, so I made a new neck for it, widened the neck pocket, made a new bridge for it, converted it over to seven and seven. And this is the most recent instrument here. This is, uh, it's maybe two years old. This is my travel guitar. It's a Douglas fir body that's completely hollow. I carved the top like an arch top and then hollowed out the body and then glued it all back together. Yeah. So it, it looks like a solid body, but it's a completely hollow and a Sitka spruce neck, which worked beautifully. It's, it's plenty stiff. Uh, it, it dents easily, you know, a soft surface, but, it, but it's entirely strong enough for, for the string tension. And the entire instrument is, as you can imagine, feather light. I assume it's got a uh, truss rod? Yeah, truss rod and two graphites, like, like everything else I do. But I, um, my, my perception is that it's a stiffer neck than, than a mahogany with, with the same stuff. And then these two are my sort of my two main gigging guitars. Uh, this one is sort of like, sort of like an ES-175, and then it's a plywood arch top, laminated top and back. Um, no solid center block, just a couple of parallel braces on the top. And Lawler pickups, Lawler Imperials in, in both of these. Love that pickup. Um, and all of these are seven string, of course. Um, mahogany body, uh, mahogany neck, Indian Rosewood fretboard. How about that big old tunematic? Uh, all parts. I don't know. Yeah. They have seven stringers yeah. like that. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, it's it's great. I'll really the uh, the bridges. You can get a Floyd Rose seven string. So um, yeah, most of the hardware is available for seven string. Thanks to the heavy metal guys, huh? Yeah, exactly. Right. Cool. Pickups not so much. So it, uh, again, the Lawler Imperial seven string is a great humbucking pickup, but there are no hum canceling single coils available for seven string. So I had to make these. They're, uh, they're actually a clone of a Barden. I found the specs online for the, for the Barden pickups, and, and uh, yeah, they're, they're pretty close. Okay. So this is uh, Royal Polonia body, so it's oh, yeah. relatively lightweight because of that, but uh, curly maple neck, and so the, uh, the neck gives it a bit of heft. And again, two graphites and a, and a, and a truss rod. And a whammy. And a whammy bar, which I never use, but it's there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. Right. You bet. Stephen Marchioni, Houston, Texas, and I'm here with a couple of, uh, of my designs, a 15-inch arch top and an OMC. Okay. What's it made out of? Well, here we've got a beautiful piece of Swiss spruce, African ebony, a maple neck, and it's built in Spanish form. So. <laughs> I see you're using the button on the back just like the old masters did. I, well, I like to copy the old masters. They seem to have the right idea. <laughs> They're pretty good, you know? Yeah, yeah, so it's very strong that way. And then, uh, and I talked about this in uh, Charles Rufino's and mine kind of design lecture today. This is an arch top built on the same platform, although the arch top came first before, you know, what came first, the chicken or the egg. But you'll notice some of these old master things, so... The button is integral to the back, and uh, the fingerboard, like on any fine Italian instrument, doesn't touch the top, where all sorts of wretchednesses happen as the top bulges. It's all flying. Yes. It's good stuff. 
Good stuff great indeed. Show. And great show. Thank you. You're welcome. So uh, what's the first show you attended, first GAL convention you attended? Well, that was the one where I actually met Guy Rabiel. We were both living and working in Manhattan, and it must have been about 93. Was there a 93 show? 92. Yeah, so I came. He did. 92 was in Vermilion, South Dakota. 95. Did Chris exhibit here? So there was a 92 and a 95? Yeah. must have been 95 then. But anyway, that's... That's when we became friends, and you know, it's important been very things. Exciting since then. <laughs> okay, thanks. Thank you. G. D. Armstrong from Yamhill, Oregon, and these are some odd things that I make. Um, if you look at them, you will realize that there are varying numbers of strings on each one. None of them with the normal number, but they average out. So this is a this is a twelve string. Uh, just terribly, uh, not terribly exciting, 12-string uh, solid body electric. I made for my partner at the music store for his first an wedding first anniversary. And the way we got away with that was his wife's name is Michelle, so this is the M for the Michelle. And then, can you get that? And then on the control cavity cover, You see that? And so she thought it was such a nice tribute. Tribute. He got away with getting another guitar. You gotta do what you gotta do. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Now what do you got here? Four little strings. This one's a tenor guitar, solid body electric tenor guitar. If we're doing the the new hot Texas style rock and roll country swing. <laughs> and here is some octave mandolin. This is. Uh, Doug Fir Burl top, which is pretty unusual to find one big enough to do that. And it's uh, two mini humbuckers. And then there's an overdrive. So you can take a Marshall stack and start playing with this thing and pull the overdrive out and make it scream in, 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 you know, for mercy. All right. And what's this one here? And this one is a, the third iteration prototype or a body style I've been trying to come up with. I was, people playing dad gad, uh, it always goes boom, tinkle, tinkle, because they're using dreadnoughts. And so I was trying to find something that was a more balanced voice all the way across. And it's a much deeper body. It's it's a, it's like a, a almost an inch deeper than dreadnought. And it's uh, has the same cubic centimeters of air in it as a dreadnought. So. I see you also got the mandolin book by uh, Graham McDonald. Graham, because he couldn't make it this year, so uh, he'd already sent the books, and I've been selling them for him. Anybody who's interested in the history of instruments, it's, it's definitely worth reading. Okay. Hey, what was your first GAL convention? When was it? Well, I weighed about 60 pounds less, so I really don't remember. 80s? 90s, yeah, it, was, it was after the San Francisco one. I was going to go to the San Francisco one, and I had to stop, had to, you know, cancel at the last minute. But it was in the 80s, definitely. Was it in Tacoma, or was it, uh, or could it have been in Colorado? Was it uh, in the Rocky Mountains? Yeah. No, the first one was in Tacoma, and then there was the Rocky Mountains one. Is that right? Well, that would have had to have been 77 in Tacoma. That's too early, right? Because after San Francisco. 86 was in Tacoma, right. The Rocky Mountains was in 82. Okay, so probably the Rocky Mountains was the first one. They get, you know, they get mixed up with other festivals. and. Well, that's going way back, man. You're a faithful friend. You know, it's, <laughs> there's only a certain number of synapses still working, you know. <laughs> okay, my name is Alan Simcoe. I'm from Bainbridge Island, about an hour that way, but not up straight up, but north. And uh, what I've got here are classical guitars. Um, you know, I've got two seven strings for playing uh, Brazilian choral music. This guy and this guy. And then a, a concert six string here. Um, a little parlor, which I like very much. I borrowed this back from the owner so I could bring it here today. And, uh, and a cavaquinho down on the end, another Brazilian instrument. Okay. And what's the difference between that and a uke? Uh, well, this is steel strung. Um, scale length is a little bit different. It's sort of the Brazilian version of the 
you know, the Renaissance guitar and the, oh, okay. the Hawaiians have the ukulele as their version of the Italian, or the, yeah, the Italian Renaissance, no, Portuguese Renaissance guitar. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, and, uh, and it's kind of the backbone of the, of the Shoro uh, rhythm section. And then the seven string, they play a lot of running bass lines. So there's a low B or low C on it. And I'm not truly building like Shoro uh, seven strings. It's kind of like concert guitars that have a seven string. Oh, okay. um, they've got, you know, the sub schools of that sort of thing uh -huh. down there. And this is more of a, uh, you can play a bunch of other things on there as well. Um, so there you go. Okay, thanks. And you're very welcome. Uh, my name is Aaron Foster, and I'm building in Oakland, California. Uh, so this is like a prototype of uh, a guitar. The shape is based on Gibson L1 from like the late 20s. Uh, it's a Sitka spruce top, uh, yellow cedar, Alaskan yellow cedar sides, uh, Spanish cedar neck, and mesquite fingerboard and bridge. How do you like that yellow cedar for bending? Uh, I thought it was kind of a pain to bend. Uh, it was all right, but it tends to sort of crumple on the inside of the curve. So the waist was a little bit of a problem, but... Well, it's a tight-waisted design, so maybe... Also that, too. Yeah. But it was nice other than that. You like the way it turned out for the sound and all? I, I really love the sound. Uh, it's a lot deeper than I would expect from such a small guitar. How about this one? Uh, so I just finished this one about three weeks ago. It's a Sipo back inside, Sika top, uh, Sipo neck, uh, maple. Um, based on a, the shape is based on a J185, uh, but it's the same bracing as in here, just sort of blown up to fit the bigger box. This is your first time at a GAL convention? It is. What do you think? It's great. It's been a lot of fun. Thanks. Thank you. Hi, I'm Paul Bristow, and I'm with, uh, well, I have Columbia Gorge Guitars, and we're uh, from Portland, Oregon, and I uh, like a variety of things. Yeah. Um, I get to work with uh, Charles Fox. We uh, teach with him at the American School of Luthery and build other things. I do lots of repair. This is the Boo Box, which was uh, uh, a new folk instrument, yeah. which was an interesting creation. Uh, this instrument uh, in front is uh, supporting the guild. Uh, this is what I bought at the silent auction last year. Nice. It was really beat up. Um, all the braces were loose, and I wanted to turn it in. You know, I thought, oh, I can just get that and turn it into something for someone. And uh, maybe I could find out who made it. Oh, that's cool. And, uh, but my wife likes it so much, she keeps it. That's what uh, you know, we take around to the Oregon Country Fair and everything. It's worked great. Did anybody confess? Not yet. Not yet. Uh, people ask what the uh, alcohol bottles are. They're actually the uh, slide oh, there you go. for the instrument. Because okay. in keeping with a folk instrument, it, yes. you know, my rules, it has to be made with, with the hand tools. You can't have an expensive slide. You'd have to have a folk alternative. Okay, I've been with the Oregon Country Fair for many, many years, and I wanted to get out of uh, being an internal security supervisor, so I thought, I want to make folk instruments that are appropriate for that. Yeah. So that's how the cigar box guitars came about, but I wanted them to have real necks and be nice, not just a one by two. Oh, yeah. And so that's how we got into that. And this is an instrument. Uh, uh, built by Ramon Iglesias, who built instruments for Jaco Pistorius and many other people. This is the second one that I've restored. I restored a five string before this, and this four string had a very twisted neck, a very irregular neck, and it had a very fascinating bridge. And yeah, it had these pins. Uh, on the top, and then the whole affair was pinned into the body, and it was a string through design. So the okay, customer yeah. provided me with this bridge, and I inset it to work. And uh, something that I really enjoyed is my dear friend, uh, Harry Fleshman came two different days, he goes, 
I really like how that plays. <laughs> that feels good. So, okay, well, that's my, uh, <laughs> that's it. Okay, like I said, I work, uh, Charles and I work together. You know, I work with him at the ASL with uh, building electric guitars, teaching. And I was talking with some of the, some of the folks that come and learn, and I found out they're bass players. And I said, well, wouldn't you rather build a bass? And they go, yeah. I said, Charles, let's do this. So um, he built a, a four-string prototype with the glued-in neck like we do. And I built this five-string prototype with a bolt-on. So the students have options of either. And so that's what this came about. And, uh, just to show them you know, what's possible, where they want to go. And I started, now I'm building bases very similar to this. Uh, yeah, with the kill switch as well. Sounds pretty wicked when you have it coming through a big ampeg and you're on down a low B and it, 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 it you know, do some stutters. Um, one of the features that I like is I've taken the control cavity over enough to where the end of the pickup route drops into there so you, there's no drilling for wiring. And uh, the other version I have for the control cavities just has, uh, well, a little more material depending on what kind of pickup you want to do. So basically I have two versions of control cavity but with the same cover plate for the other ones I'm building. I got three bodies going, they just need necks. Stuff. So that's it and I, will, this, I just want to say this organization is so important, critically important and I do everything I can to support it. It's very important. What's the, first, uh, what's the first convention you attended? I think it was 98. And I, it took me a few years to get here, urging my friends, buddy that was teaching me other stuff. But how I, or maybe it was before that, I know I, I first got uh, interested in guitars was as a guitar builder, or, or, or as a, a player when I was a kid. But I grew up, my dad uh, repaired uh, pianos, pipe organs, uh, reed organs, and you know, I, uh, it was my job to, when I was a little kid, to shine the ivories, buff the ivories, and to, clean the, uh, uh, the sharps and shoot them with lacquer and then I got into rebuilding the uh, player piano units, you know, with all hide glue, pulling the bellows off and redoing that. So I just kind of started moving all those uh, over to this, but I've always done music and aviation, so I put some of the aircraft um, mechanic and inspector stuff into that technology, which makes it a lot of fun. So you grew up in the instrument, uh, in the musical instrument biz, yeah. like most of us didn't. Ah, yeah, I was actually trained uh, on 12 different instruments, and then I kind of settled more on guitar, and then I played with other instruments just on my own without any training, you know. But in about 78, um, Jay Hargraves, well, we were playing. His brother's a... Uh, a drummer, he's the bass, I'm a guitarist, so we'd play together. And he was already heavily into building, you know, back then. He was trying to get me to go and get me to build. And I had a cabinet shop with a dear friend of mine. And I, uh, he would come and use the table saw, and we bought lumber for Blackstock Lumber in Seattle. And yes, a couple pieces I still have, or got back, actually. And, uh, but I kind of dropped it. I, I think I was too busy, and it's so much, but he kept after me, and then it finally got to the point where, okay, let's just complete it and get to this part, you know, of the building. Because I was, well, repairing since my very first guitar, just applying the principles that I learned in the other part of Luthery with the pianos and reed organs and, and uh, because, you know, a reed organ, you don't buy parts, right? <laughs> you make everything, even if it's the reeds, yeah, yeah. <laughs> springs, everything, you know? And so just applied those skills over, it made so much sense. Well, it's about that time, it's 10 minutes till five, got to well, pack it out. I can't tell you how much that I appreciate all the work of, well, the guild at large, but, you know, you leaders um, for making it happen. It's very, very important. And this year I was so, my heart was so warmed by seeing so many new people, yeah. new members. and. And young people coming in and you know developing it's, it's important. The guild's uh, like 45 years old now. There's a lot of people here. Are they younger than the guild? The guild is good. The guild is great. The, the guild, guild is, is great and good. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Tim.